Smith? Here. Deskin? Here. Yandemir? Here. Beretta? Here. All right. Well, um, today I want to kind of give a little run through of trying to uh, speak on our, our council liaisons. I know Joanne had been wanting to speak a little bit about um, her role and if any of the other aldermen want to speak to uh, some of the tasks that they've been uh, uh, given, I'd be happy to hear that. Um, I'm happy to speak a little first on things that have been going on. You know, one of the things that I've kind of put in my lap is economic development. A um, couple things that happened this week I think were good. I did have an opportunity last Monday, last Tuesday, to drive a couple uh, big money guys around, some big developers. Um, one is does stuff all over the world. The other guy is very big in Chicagoland. Um, they were very excited about the stuff that's going on, um, very excited about even the downtown. I was kind of surprised. I thought they'd be more focused up on our properties by the highway, but uh, their words to me were, I've done stuff all over Chicagoland. You keep polishing up downtown and everything follows. Um, he said, but still, they were very interested in actually doing something. So I gave them a lot of information. Um, they're noodling things around. And uh, so that was a good, a good thing. I think we should be encouraged about some of the stuff we've been doing. They were excited about seeing the building turned around downtown, um, even the festivals and stuff. They saw the energy that goes on with them, so they felt good about it. Um, really, really wanted to be a part of it. So that was one thing that was interesting. Um, another thing, too, I was down this week talking to the uh, committee in Springfield about the closing of the Illinois State Museum campus. Yeah, as you guys know, there's a, the big battle with the budget right now. And I understand both sides of it. You can't hand a guy a budget with a $4 billion hole in it and expect him to sign it. It's just ridiculous. Um, but what I've been frustrated with and what I testified in front of the committee was like, look, I get that you've got to look at these museum campuses of which we have one in Lockport. Um, but I would have a little communication. One of the things that happened was when the governor's office asked uh, the state museums to start closing, uh, the Illinois State Museum kind of went into overdrive and had a little panic attack and cleared out our exhibit like almost overnight without even talking to me. And uh, that's part of our summer art series exhibit. And I said to them, I would have appreciated at least a phone call because I think we could have worked this out. And in fact, we could have. I talked to Tom Thanis and he said that our, the, the reason they cleared it out was because they said, well, we'll have no insurance come July 1st. Well, we could have helped with that. Our rider would have covered that exhibit for no cost. So it kind of bothered me. And I was very clear with the committee that, uh, and the director of IDNR, who's, uh, the governor's appointee it's like look why don't we have a little communication with this maybe there's ways that we can work through this i said you know this museum campus let's set aside the cultural implications which i firmly believe in and just look at it as a business standpoint i use that museum to further our economic it's part of things like the summer art series it's part of the festivals it's part of what got those investors excited this week they come down and they see it and I believe the economic benefit that it, um, it uh, brings, for instance, the $1.5 million Ember rehab, I think is part of the mojo of having the Illinois State Museum campus in there. So I, I testified to those and I gave them some of that information. And we'll see. In the meantime, I talked to John Lustig, the director here at the Illinois State Museum, and I uh, asked him, let's, let's make our own exhibit. So I said, you know, we still have the rest of the summer. I said, you're still gonna be here until September, most likely. I said, let's do a people show. I said, I wanna get everybody who's got artwork in the town, in the city, in the region, bring it here. And if Springfield can't manage our assets, we'll do it for them. So I wanna fill that room, that museum, floor to ceiling, end to end. I want, I want the artwork fit together like jigsaw puzzles. I don't care if it's, uh, you know, Barbie Donnelly's Renoir, or it's uh, your Aunt Tilly's award-winning quilt, or it's your daughter's crayon. It's artwork that's important to you. The only thing that's required is that it's framed. And uh, you can start bringing that artwork down on July 27th to the Illinois State Museum, and let's fill it up. Let's make a statement that says these assets are important to us. And uh, I even got on the letterpress, and I made a, uh, my handbills for it. So I'll make a bunch of these, right? The people show. So it should be good. We'll make our own little statement. And uh, fortunately, we are able to cover it with the insurance on our rider as a summer art series. 
So it doesn't cost us anything, doesn't cost the state anything. It's a way we work together to make these things happen. So that was something um, that really truly is tied in my mind to economic development because like I said, I believe it had a lot to do with uh, getting embers in here and other development that's now excited. And lastly, for business retention, um, you guys are familiar with the, uh, um, the scavenger hunt. Have any of you guys seen the maps yet for that? It's really fun. Um, that's been working great. I mean, basically it brings people to visit, you know, 37 different businesses uh, to pick up the scavenger hunt cards, which is part of the Summer Art Series. And I can tell you right now, the Studio 905, the interior designer, they spoke in here before. She said she had a mother come in uh, with her daughter to pick up a card from Thunder Hill. She said, I got a big order out of it. She goes, the lady had never been here before, had no idea. She goes, uh, it was a great order. And that's exactly what it's about. It's about business retention, taking care of our small businesses as well. So it's been a lot of fun. And uh, thank the people that participated in it. So that's kind of my report for today. Um, Joanne, did you have something that you wanted to speak about? <clears throat> uh, yes. Um, so when you assigned us to these committees, um, on June 1st is when I started mine. Um, and I called uh, Tom Fulton, our code enforcement, uh, enforcement officer, and I asked him to take me around and kind of show me where the boundaries were and, and all the main corridors to I-355. And, um, and I tried to look at it in the eyes of someone coming into our area that would be interested or just a visitor. My thought was it would be nice to have um, the boundaries of Lockport, and I know, and I, to my amazement, I, I realized this unincorporated area is in between the incorporated area of Lockport, that uh, a lot of people would not know that, okay? I, I, for the first time, I realized how much unincorporated areas we have. If you blink, you might be in an unincorporated area thinking that you're in Lockport. So that was quite an education to me also. So I figured if someone is coming in to our area, um, I'd like for Lockport to be distinguished as, okay, we're in Lockport now. So in order to do that, I felt we need to um, actually tighten up the appearance on these main corridors. So um, I asked Tom, I says, okay, so where are we here and why is this looking the way it is and blah, blah, blah. And then he you know, proceeded to tell me that some of the areas, unfortunately, unless we get Will County involved, that we really don't have a whole lot to say other than contacting them and getting them on the ball to notify uh, the, those residents to clean up, you know, trim and things like that. So I had some suggestions. Um, went through and then a couple weeks later then I went with Pam um, Hearth and, um, and Tom Fulton again and we drove around to the commercial areas. Uh, they showed me um, the properties that uh, they would maintain uh, all the way down to I-355 and we definitely need to tighten up the appearances a little bit. Um, so I came up with some suggestions and I need the council and the mayor um, to please help me kind of tighten up some of these things that we need to do in order to get these, the appearance of Lockport um, in the standard that it should be. So I, I suggested that perhaps, um, I know that um, uh, public works or um, our, the, the landscaping part of public works, that they're out sometimes um, um, cutting some of the median, you know, and some of the um, main uh, corridors like the, um, um, Archer, from Archer Avenue all the way into 9th um, State Street. And um, I know that they do do the cutting, um, but right along that little strip, there are some areas that could use a little bit of and do the fact that not everyone's seems to um, actually tend to the parkway like they should, I thought that perhaps while we were out there already trimming, that perhaps we could just go and trim and just make it look good. We're there already, and I know that it's gonna require some more time from our public works, um, and you know I don't know how, how that's all going to be involved, but that's where I need the mm -hmm. advice of the council and you know the mayor and how we're gonna do this. But I think if they're out there, perhaps they can go ahead 
and trim some of the area so that while they were out there, they did that, and now we're good for another week, two weeks, depending on the growth of the grass. I also um, uh, realized that we probably need to change some of our codes, just tweak them a little bit. Um, they may be a little bit outdated, and so by tweaking them a little bit to bringing them more to today's standard, uh, that might help us also in, um, in like for, for example, the grass. Right now we have eight inches. After eight inches, then you know the the a resident would get fined or a letter sent, and if they don't do it within a certain period of time, they would get fined. Everywhere that I've checked, it's usually six inches, okay, and that's really still high, but it's six inches. So perhaps we might need to uh, tweak that a little bit and make it a little you know, six inches instead of eight inches, um, and then just updating our codes for some of the um, uh, garage sale signs and. Um, um, you know, the parkways that they need to really trim those nicely because when, like you said, you have, you know, the um, commercial people coming through, first impressions are everything. If we don't have that first impression, I think we, we might uh, lose them. So if we just clean up and just maintain, and I don't know how Public Works, um, Public Works actually has a set up where who actually does the landscaping? Is there a couple people that tend to that and that's their job? Or is it that there's just a group that just goes out, does it, and then that's it? I need to know all that so that I know how to handle it. And maybe I, we need to sit down <coughs> and talk and just kind of come to put our heads together and see what we can come up with. Um, I also suggested that we meet with Will County, the code enforcement uh, people there, so that way we can put together something so that they know where we're coming from and how we need their assistance in, in the people that are in the unincorporated area. So those are all the things that I've come up with since I've been driving around and I, and I do it on a regular basis to see how long it takes for some of these properties to you know, cut their grass and, and we still have commercial areas that aren't cut, doing it. They're not maintaining their properties like they should. Well, thanks, Joanna. I appreciate your work in going around looking at those things. And I agree with you. And I know you and I have talked a little bit about this beforehand. Um, you know, one of the things, and Ben and I started talking about this, the unincorporated areas really do, I mean, when you come down Archer, it's, it's all pa patchwork. So what, it's true. What's not necessarily Lockport can look really bad and, and has a bad, you know, it reflects on us poorly. So either us working together tightly with the township and Will County mm -hmm. to get them to enforce it, or quite frankly, I'm, I'm at a point where it's like I, maybe a little forced annexation along, along those roads, those arteries is in order, because if I have to send guys out to cut the grass, you'd recommend it, oh, just keep cutting it. Um, that's fine, except in the end, it does take time. So if I have to hire another guy to be able to handle that much more cutting, well, then I'm gonna need the revenue to cover it. So if it matter of, doing a little forced annexation along I-171, uh, I think that's worth considering. I also would like to suggest <clears throat> that I think we need to have one or two people just concentrating on the maintenance, on doing the grass cutting or the, you know planting the flowers in certain areas so that it looks nice, especially in the summertime. Um, I, I think we may have to have certain people just do that Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's possible, but I know other villages and in, in towns do that. They have certain people, I see them every day when I'm going through those towns. They're watering flowers or they're cutting and trimming. So they must have some people assigned just to the landscaping. Yeah. And perhaps that's what we need to think uh, about. Right now we have Junior Vance does the watering and stuff like that in the downtown, but obviously to go through the whole arteries, it, it's going to require more than just Junior. So. Um, yeah, and I think the only way to cover those costs is going to be to bring some of these properties in. It's like I've never been a fan of annexing, but if they're not taking care of their properties, it's really making us look bad. And that, those guys I drove around, that's their number one thing. It's like, man, you've got to clean this up. It looks terrible. So I agree. Uh, our current uh, code is five garage sales a year. That's a lot. You know, do one in the spring and one in the fall. Because I got a guy, it's his business crying out loud it's like he was going out buying stuff and selling it every day on state street it's like it's not a business man it's a garage sale so that change 
And the parking of, of trucks and cars, I think some of those are in unincorporated they areas, are. but no one would know that. No, coming into they town. don't. They don't. So that's why I, I agree with you. And uh, in case you're wondering, uh, Joanne is our mistress of curb appeal. So that's her liaison. No, I just kidding. So thank you, Joanne. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else have anything they want to talk about? Yeah, I do. Um, I met with. Why don't you uh, say what your liaisonship is? Well, for I this think well, safety officer or safety liaison is one. Okay. Okay. Uh, I met with uh, the uh, chief Lemming and deputy uh, chief um, Draxler, Lieutenant Huff, uh, Phil Rittenhouse from EMA, and I think that's all that was there about a month ago, and it was before the uh, the Coal City. Uh, tornado and my, my question to, uh, was uh, do we have any disaster type of a plan and um, and I learned that Phil has been working on it for about the last two years he's it, it's in the end stages with uh, approval from Will County and um, so then the, the then the thought process was well um, maybe uh, next spring after the spring musical, we could incorporate uh, the drama department at the, um, at the school to go ahead and have a dry run of something. And literally one week later, we had the, the uh, um, tornado in, in Coal City. So um, that's just, just a thought process. Uh, what we kind of came up with, the good news is, is we do have something in, in, in order. Wait a minute, you want the drama department to fake a disaster? Is that what you just said? Well, yeah. They, okay. uh, they, I just wanted to make sure I heard that right. <laughs> no, no, okay. they'll, 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 they'll be the actors. And yeah, yeah. The, they'll be the actors. That's, okay, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? I yeah. just wanted to make sure I heard it right. Well, okay, I may ahead. not have said it that way, but yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> Good. Just yeah. make sure I don't want any overacting. <laughs> no! I got hit by you, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That, that's all. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate that. And nobody works harder than Phil Rittenhouse. I'm positive. The guy's everywhere. Everywhere. So... I appreciate that. All right. Anybody else have anything they want to report on? I'll just talk briefly. Okay. Yeah, just, uh, I met with Amy Wagner. Uh, I kind of deal with the public works, a little bit of the infrastructure. So uh, those of you who know Amy Wagner, you know she's a pleasure to work with, talk to. So she's a wealth of knowledge, information, uh, whether it be today or tomorrow, she knows what's going on. So um, again, meeting with Amy, uh, you, you try to take some notes and there's lots to take down. So, but anyway, I'll just kind of Amy has well planned out, again, all our projects that are ongoing and upcoming. I mean, she is just on top of everything. Uh, she, uh, I know, does her very best to get information out what needs to get out, and she oversees all these projects to make sure everybody's aligned and inspections. And I know she works very hard at that. She does her very best at that. So, um, other things, but um, again, and, and not only, I mean, what goes into this, too, I want to explain to it is planning. A lot of people may not realize, but I mean, there's planning for these projects to where that, you know, we're always worried about, okay, what are we disrupting when we, when we do these things? And then Amy goes and, and, and un tries to understand the flow of traffic, the neighborhood, and she makes all that work. So, again, I just want to give her kudos for all that. But, again, if you know, uh, you drive down from some of the main arteries, you'll see the dust flying. Uh, that's a good thing, right? Um, you know, she's doing some, uh, some water mains and doing those projects, which are duly needed. I, I know we have to uh, put up with the dust a little bit and parking maybe a block away, but uh, these projects are so well needed and it's gonna be so uh, so nice to have these done in the subdivisions and I think the homeowners are very appreciative of all this too. So again, real brief, but I just wanted to, to say that, uh, as you know, there, there is a lot of work going on in public works. Uh, they're, they're very conscious of their work and uh, they're proud of them, so thank you. Okay, right on, man. All right, anything else? Last one. I'll hey, say Jim. So. Uh, just keep it quick. Uh, planning and zoning department, it, we, uh, I've met with uh, <coughs> Pam and Amy in the planning and zoning department and Amy today uh, with engineering. And uh, one of the bigger goals for me is just kind of helping the process get more uh, efficient and get it more consistent so that when developers do come in, and they see everything that is nice that they can go through a process and get go through our system easier and more consistent and understand everything that we're doing and then get the board on on board of what we want as a whole in a 
an agreement. So we'll be working on that in the next couple months. All right. I appreciate that. Thanks, Jim. All right. All I see is steam coming out of Bob's ears. These are going to take forever. <laughs> <laughs> no steam today. All right. That's but, cool. Uh, just a few words, uh, Mark, <clears throat> of the, the city. Sat down with uh, Jack Linehan. I think it was the third Wednesday of June, or, or was it the third Monday? But anyway, uh, one of the residents <clears throat> in town, Kathy Gentile, she had an idea as far as incorporating modern technology to promote uh, the city, uh, more specifically small businesses. And she actually met with a particular app designer uh, that is specifically designed to promote cities. And she showed us a couple examples uh, in our meeting. And uh, Jack has all the information. He's going to mull it over. Uh, just due to time, because of the summer art series coming to pass this coming July, we just didn't have enough time to really institute anything. Mm -hmm. But we should have something uh, to propose in the next few months as Jack is continuing his research. But as far as marketing the city, I think all of us up here as council members, uh, it's our duty to market the city uh, every day, every opportunity we get. Uh, one of the endeavors that I uh, had a goal six years ago when I was elected is uh, affordable family entertainment. Uh, I signed up for the Moose Lodge right here on 10th Street. And over the last four or five years, I signed up 26 families and individuals to the Moose Lodge. Why is that important? Not so much just for the Moose Lodge, which is important, but it's important for the downtown. It's important that we expose various individuals and families throughout the city. Hey, here's the Moose Lodge, but here's the downtown. I utilize the State of Illinois Museum also, a tour, of the, <coughs> not only of the tour of the Moose Lodge, but here is what we have downtown. Here's the restaurants, here's our confectionery, you buy some nice chocolates. So just give them the tour so they're aware of what's available to them. Uh, it's very difficult to get residents that are on one side of Fair Road to come uh, to the other side of Fair Road to the downtown. So that's something that uh, I'm particularly proud of to um, engage the residents in, into the downtown. And probably I have a couple enrollments right here in this room <laughs> looking at one of them, but uh, uh, Darren Deskin is also uh, in enrollment, and he probably lives at the, the Moose Lodge right now. So uh, it's part of the solution. That's what you have to do when your wife kicks you out of the house. <laughs> That's the whole point. It's, it's part of the solution. We all play a part in promoting the city, and we do that as council members. And I'll end with this final story. I got my hair cut this past Monday at Great Clips, and I saw a resident at Great Clips Oh, you're going to go at the car show. I was like, oh, my God, I forgot all about it. I spent so much time promoting the car show. I forgot all about it. I'll see you there. So I met up with him and another resident, which goes to my point, is if you do a really good job marketing the city, uh, they're going to be marketing for you and for the city. And in this particular example, they reminded me. All right. That's my, <laughs> my quick update. That's good. Right on. Thanks, Bob. All right, crew. We appreciate it. Um, I look forward to uh, continuing on with these liaison ships. I think they'll be beneficial. Um, ben, what do you got? You got something at CA1? Yes, thank you, Mayor. We have a uh, inform informative presentation tonight. I know Jack, I think, is going to introduce uh, Steve Zimmerman, and I think I saw Ms. Um, DeVivo. Um, a while back, we had the uh, Long Run Creek study, um, which included the um, Lockport, Homer Glen, Lamont, and nearby townships affected mm -hmm. uh, with the Long Run Creek watershed. And I think he's just going to come with us the executive uh, session from that or executive report and some of the highlights. And yeah. Oh, thank you. So maybe, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Maybe thank just you introduce man. yourself and my let's get right into it. Jack, did you want to say anything or you want me to, or does Marcia want to say anything or you want me to just, <laughs> everyone's like, no, you take it. <laughs> I okay. promise to be less than two minutes. So. I, I really want to thank you for participating in this because it's not always easy to get people engaged in this. And, and it was a, a kind of an exhausting process. I'm sort of glad it was over with, but, you know, it's, it's timeless. Oh, speaking of the mic, ma'am, can you come up to the mic? Please. But it, it's, it's, pr it's pretty timeless. I mean, this, this watershed plan will be out there for years and years to come. It will help you if get grants because it's a plan, and there's there's in the in the actual uh, body of the plan are 
suggestions on what should be done and how to go about getting these things done. So I'll let you go ahead. They're not actually asking for any money tonight, so that's Yay. <laughs> no, we're telling you you can get money. Um, I'm, I'm Steve Zimmerman. I'm a senior ecologist with Applied Ecological Services, and I, I want to start out by saying, um, so this is, was a watershed plan, and I'll tell you exactly what that is in a minute, but Marsha um, DeVivo was the, the watershed coordinator. Essentially, everything kind of went through her. She set up all the meetings. She was my point of contact. Um, and Jack was basically your representative from Lockport, and you were pretty much at every meeting, or you, Jack, for the most part. We had, okay, yeah, well, we had, I don't know, 12, 12 meetings or something like that. But um, so let me get into this. So this is the first time I've done it this way. So everyone can kind of see their screen. I'll use my pointer instead of my laser pointer on this one. Um, just really quickly. Um, about my company, just so you know a background and why we did this plan. Um, I work for our consulting division, we also have a contracting division, and we have a native plant nursery. So we're basically a design-build ecological consulting company. <clears throat> and we have done now nine of these watershed plans. Several of, I think four or five of these, or six of these are actually done in Illinois. And this particular plan, everyone or most of you hopefully have this executive summary and it kind of outlines what I'm going to talk about today. But the plan was funded through an EPA 319 grant, which paid for 60% of the plan. And then essentially each of the communities gave some money and their match time to, um, to pay for the other 40% of the grant that paid for the, the plan. So for those of you that still are like, okay, well, what's a watershed? <laughs> so let's start there. Um, it's generally an area of land where, where water drains off into a common location like a creek, a stream, or a lake. And this map on the right here shows you this is the Des Plaines River watershed. And then within it, this is the Long Run Creek watershed, this little red area. And then there's kind of a blow up of it over here, so it, all of this area drains to the Des Plaines River and is essentially split by um, Will County and uh, is it Cook County. And so just, this is kind of the definition of watershed planning. It's, it's a voluntary, community-supported approach to protecting, improving water quality first, um, groundwater, habitat for wildlife, for reducing flooding, um, and ultimately providing opportunities for people. So this is kind of a cool map from the watershed plan. It shows the topography of Long Run Creek watershed. And again, so everything drains to the west here. And you see these brown areas are the relatively flat areas in the upper reaches as you get nearer to the creek, the darker areas represent more topography and it's in size more and as you work your way down you can see you've got all these little tributaries that start to run in and it, the topography changes quite a bit from the west half to the east half and historically what the landscape would have looked like is down here on the bottom right is prairie and almost this entire area out here historically was prairie and um, picture here represents what uh, woodland savanna would have looked like and that is essentially what this area in here was historically just to kind of give you a perspective of what the landscape looked like 200 years ago so today um, this is kind of what we're looking at and actually in the executive summary and in the middle there's um, some land use maps but I didn't want to show all that stuff um, these are the municipalities in the watershed and Homer Glen is the, the largest municipality. This up here is Forest Preserve. We have Orland Park, Lamont, and you all are the pink here, uh, Lockport. And so you don't, there's not a huge stake in this watershed, but certainly if you know areas are annexed and whatnot, um, more of Lockport will be in Long Run Creek watershed eventually. This just shows just a, a really quick representation of what the streams look like in the watershed and essentially the the red areas are 
areas of stream that are highly eroded and are not doing well, whereas the green are in better shape. So you can see up here where it's relatively flat, you don't have a whole lot of erosion, but as you go downstream, and I told you the topography was, you know, it was hillier and there's more relief here, you start to get a, a lot of erosion of the creek channels in here, and particularly this one, which includes parts of Lamont, um, is, is a, a heavy contributor of sediment to the Des Plaines River. A little bit about detention basins. So we surveyed every detention basin in the watershed. And this is important because um, a lot of our developed areas now drain to a detention basin. That's essentially where we capture and, and treat the water before it's released to a creek or a stream or a lake. Um, I think there was, uh, yeah, so there's 185 basins and we determined for ecological and water quality function, 125 of these essentially serve no ecological function. All they do is store stormwater after rain events. So they're designed only for stormwater uh, volume and, and for nothing else. <clears throat> and I'll tell you why that's important and what we're recommending. A little bit about wetlands. This is always kind of cool to look at. This map shows in green where all of the wetlands existed historically and in purple where we have wetlands left. So of the 1,300 acres of wetlands in the watershed, only about 35% of them remain. So we're, we're essentially shifting the land and moving all the water off the land as quickly as we can and it's causing problems. Um, you don't have to look real closely at this, but this is just a snapshot of water data that was collected in the watershed and what it is showing is that there's high phosphorus, there's high nitrogen, and there's a lot of uh, sediment and turbidity in the water following rain events. And this little graphic is was done using a pollutant loading model and fortunately for you all, you're not one of the major contributors to the, the pollution in the watershed. If you look at these, this graph, most of the nitrogen and phosphorus, the blue, um, is coming from the two wastewater treatment plants in Homer Glen. And most of the sediment, which is right here, is coming from stream bank erosion. So those are the, the, the major contributors of pollutants in the watershed. So what we did as part of this watershed plan, we do for all our plans, is we literally drive around the watershed and we look for potential projects. And then through the meetings, we gather information from municipalities about where they think water quality projects can be implemented. And we end up with um, an action plan um, in that 300 page report that's up there. And the action plan, just um, whoever might want to look at it in more detail, it's actually broken out by municipality. And then under each municipality, there's different types of projects, stream restoration, detention basin retrofits, but it's set up in a way where you only have to look at your portion to find out what projects are in Lamont. But then from the, all those recommendations, and there's hundreds of them, there is what's called the critical areas. So the, these are the areas in the watershed where it's determined if um, things are improved or saved or developed in the right way could significantly help the watershed conditions. And um, we'll come back to this briefly. So I'm gonna go through some of these recommendations. Again, there aren't a lot in Lamont, but I'll, I'll show you, or I'm sorry, Lockport, but I'll show you some um, that are here. Um, there are a couple critical areas, and we'll get to those, I think, at the end. But here's some examples of, um, this is our map for the detention basin retrofit projects. In other words, how to take an existing basin that I told you isn't serving uh, a purpose um, other than stormwater storage, and how to convert it into something that treats stormwater, um, and it also improves wildlife. And I think 30A, which is right here, was a medium priority recommendation. Um, and I know I probably had a picture of it somewhere because I took pictures of all these. At any rate, um, we'll assume it's you know a typical detention basin. And then this next picture shows an example of what a, a naturalized detention basin looks like. And so this is um, 
designed to treat, not only hold storm water, but treat the storm water for pollutants, and it's also excellent wildlife habitat. Um, essentially, it's a detention basin that's been converted into a wetland detention basin. Um, so wetland restoration, that's, that's a difficult one in a watershed setting and difficult for people to do unless they're creating a wetland mitigation bank, and we won't get into that. But there were a couple locations in Lockport, 25 and 27, right here in this little guy here. But essentially what those areas are is we, um, from the soils information, we know they used to support wetlands, but they've been drained, um, usually by drain tiles from farmers. And those areas, you can see kind of on the aerial image, see these dark areas? Um, these are areas in an agricultural field that would have been wetland historically and they've been tile drained. But the recommendation we're making about wetland restoration is if areas are developed, it's best to try to use those areas that were wetland historically as to locate your detention and then create wetland detention because it um, obviously is the water drains to those areas and it's kind of a ideal spot to put these naturalized detention basins. And this is just a, a picture of a wetland restoration project that our company did up in Lake County. Um, riparian restoration, which essentially is the same thing as stream restoration. I believe there was uh, one project in Lockport, and, um, and I forget who owns this area down here. It's just south of the uh, material services property, but it's just a medium priority recommendation. And really, that area is not bad. It just has a lot of invasive species along the stream corridor. Um, one thing I did notice after looking at this, there's a high priority um, stream that runs up into part of Lockport. But this is a larger, what we call a stream reach, and most of it fell in this area, so it's included under, um, I think, Lockport Township, their recommendations, rather than under Lockport. And these are a couple example projects that our company has done, so um, I should have had some before and afters, but it, this one on the left shows a project after a degraded stream was repaired. Um, that's essentially within a month after. And this one on the right here is in Barrington, and again, it's a, it was a ditch that uh, we pulled back the bank, seeded it, planted it, put in these artificial riffles, but this kind of is what a, a restored stream would look like. So this is probably what pertains most to you all, is we have what we call green infrastructure protection areas. And we used um, like a point system and, and, and some other information to pull out these red areas on the map. And a lot of these are what are currently agricultural areas, but they're proposed to be developed in the future. So the recommendation we're making is, yeah, it's fine to develop them, but these parcels in red are shown in locations that if traditional stormwater practices are used, it's probably going to negatively affect the stream systems that the water runs to. So the one that's most applicable to you all is this one here. And I, I, it looks like there's maybe something going on there now when I drove by. Um, but you can see it's right at the headwaters of this tributary. So if water is not stored properly and treated, this, this is a critical green infrastructure protection area. Not to protect from development. Development can go in, but probably needs to have some extra uh, stormwater treatment and, and holding type detention facilities. So that is your, you've got a couple over here too, but that is really probably the most critical area in Lockport related to this watershed. Um, so this just shows an example of, you know, how an area like that would be developed versus a traditional development. And this is just residential, and it shows how, you know, the, it's kind of cluster housing, which preserves more of the green space. And then this is where the stream corridor would go in here, um, and it's preserved and enhanced. <clears throat> so um, to kind of wrap this up, the next steps. So we all decided at these committee, these watershed planning meetings, I think the very last meeting, we had a pretty long discussion about what we wanted this plan to do for everyone. Um, 
and we'd like to see each municipality adopt it, um, not as ordinance, but just for, as a guidance document. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that, whether it should be required, and it was kind of a general consensus, no, it should be a guidance document. Um, and, and I guess the, the Watershed Planning Committee is asking just to incorporate some of the goals from this, um, use some of the education material, build demonstration projects. And the last thing on here is the most important, is apply for these Illinois 319 grants. So, so here's the deal. The Illinois EPA has this 319 grant program, and it's basically the go-to program for doing these types of projects I showed you. And they're one of the only, um, it's one of the only grants around where they actually have some money. And um, the, they're getting so many applications now that they've now changed their, the application format so that essentially if you're proposed project isn't in one of their approved watershed plans, they throw it away. That's how, that's where it's gone. There's only about 12 to 15 watershed plans that have been done in the whole state, and you have one for a portion of your watershed. Um, I've done several of these up in McHenry County and Lake County, and just last year we applied for a $1.2 million stream restoration, and it was funded because it was called out as a critical area in a watershed plan, and the EPA funded $800,000 of a $1.2 million project. This year I, I just submitted one for the village of Algonquin for an $800,000 stream restoration. Um, and they've already basically told me that the project is such, um, it's already been designed and permitted that it's a no brainer for them to, um, to give us the grant. And I also sent in two other grants uh, applications for two other projects in that same watershed. So if you use the plan the way it's meant to be used um, for these 319 grants, if, if the project falls in the watershed and it's supported by the watershed plan, there's a good possibility um, of getting match money. Now the other thing to note, just to wrap this up, is 2016 is a, what the EPA is calling a priority year for the Upper Fox River, for funding projects in the Upper Fox River watershed. I'm not sure what year it is for this portion of the watershed. I need to look that up, but they, they have different areas they wanna put their money in in different years. So whenever that year comes up and, and there's a potential project you all might be thinking of, that would be the time to potentially ap apply for one of these, these grants. All righty. Anything else? I appreciate it. Thanks for the information. Um, I think it's certainly I'm glad we did it. Um, we could talk about it more and talk about it. Uh, yeah, maybe in another committee the whole about things that we could adopt or look at so mm -hmm. all right well thank you folks we do appreciate you coming out here yeah. all right lisa we're going to talk about uh vehicle stickers just a quick uh background on this to bring everybody up to speed we did talk about uh getting rid of the vehicle sticker you know, about a year and a half ago or something it was something that i asked uh mr brown you know, our last finance guy to take a look at. I mean, none of us really like the vehicle sticker. It's, it's a hassle. It's, uh, it's onerous. You have to come down to City Hall. It's very inefficient. It takes up a lot of staff time. It's, it's costly. Um, I wanted to find a way to get rid of it. Um, and if there was a way that we could shift revenue to some other way so that we don't, uh, you know, we don't lose the revenue, but at the same time, I didn't want to stick it to anybody um, one of the problems that we had last time, I felt, was the uh, we looked at a uh, the electricity, you know, tax, but it was uh, it was going to hit the um, some of the other taxing bodies, like the school districts. And quite frankly, I didn't want to shift our tax to them. Then they have to raise their levy. So I asked, uh, you know, so I kind of dropped it. Um, I know Jason who's one of our finance, he's our finance liaison, and Lisa, they've been working and talking about this a little bit more. This was something Jason wanted to bring up. So I believe, Lisa, you have some other solutions that maybe we could find that will enable us to get rid of the vehicle sticker. And 
not necessarily pinch somebody else in the process. So right. I don't know, why, don't you, why don't you lay it on us? Thank you, Mayor. So as a non-home uh, rule community, we're limited as to the type of taxes that we can even charge our residents. Uh, one of them that we came up with was the electricity tax, which is based on kilowatt hours. Um, the vehicle stickers are restricted for our capital improvement projects, and therefore if we adopt the electricity tax, we would be adopting it with that same focus, okay, to keeping it for the capital improvement projects. Um, 46 million is what was approved in that CIP plan, so we have a long way to go to fund that. Um, so one of these slides that I have here show you what other neighboring municipalities. So there's 280 municipalities in the state of Illinois that charge this tax. The maximum percentage that can be charged is 5%. 96% um, of the municipalities charge between a rate of 0 0.366 and 0 0.628. 628 is the, the max that you see out there. So you can see that line in Manhattan, Plainfield, New Lenox all charge at that highest rate. A step down from there is Romeoville, Orland Hills, um, Shorewood, Lamont. So you could see where, where they're charging at, you know, around us. <clears throat> what I came up with was uh, five options. One, at the, the first one is at the max. That's 5%, okay? Um, the lowest one is uh, we're within all those that I'm, sure, that I'm showing you there, that's 96% of the municipalities are charging within that. Um, so those are the diff different options. So lowering from the max rate by 90% would charge at a 4.5% rate. And you could see what those rates are there. So what we determined from ComEd, some information we received from ComEd, is that an average household here in Lockport uses 788 kilowatt hours. Okay? So that's the average that we're looking at. Um, option three went down to 80%, option four 70%, option five was 60%. And you can see down along the bottom, the actual revenue that we would be obtaining uh, is listed below under each of those options. And Lisa, can you remind us again what the vehicle sticker brings in? Uh, the vehicle sticker, we budgeted $262,000 of revenue for this year. And that include, that's what you clear, or do you still have to pay that's 40? Gross. That's okay. the gross. And we have uh, between forty dollars and $50,000 minimum of expense, between okay. 1,500 hours of uh, estimated costs at the payroll department, at the um, PD department, for administering this, so the cost of the sticker itself, the cost of postage, envelopes, so that's not a net, that's, that's okay. the gross revenue. Um, this is how the, these five options that I gave you in the rate structure would uh, come out to for the resident. So an average uh, monthly, which I told you was 788 kilowatt hours, um, that would bring in a monthly revenue. We'll, we'll just, just look at uh, option five, the last option that's out there. Um, the monthly revenue uh, per household would be $2.88. So the average on an annual revenue base would be about $35. And the cost of two vehicle stickers right now is 36. So at that option, there would be actually a cost savings to the resident of $1.41. Minimal, but it, that's basically our, our break even from where we're at. Any option above that would obtain additional money that we could be used for capital projects to have have, uh, help us fund the $46 million that we have planned to do over the next six years. So those are the options that we're really looking at council discussing to determine which of those makes the most sense for us. So option three would be an extra $12 per household per year. So a dollar a month is what option three would bring into the city. Okay, now let me ask you the question is, because you know my concern last time was that this then also has to be taken over by, say, you know, the, the schools and the churches, people that hadn't had to pay this tax. Did these numbers include those people, or does that exclude those? The revenue figures that I'm showing you right here are for residents only. Okay. Okay, but we have not, uh, we would have to specifically exclude uh, any type of nonprofit or government mm -hmm. to be able to have them exempt from this tax. So there's, it, there is a possibility to do that if the council decides to go that way. What ComEd has asked of us is for us to identify <coughs> names and addresses of each of those facilities mm -hmm. in our town. Okay. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. Okay. Lisa, you mentioned you could exclude those government entities. Is it possible to have some type of program in place where, let's say there's a scenario where someone has no car or one car and it's a senior rate at $9, 
where they could come in for like a reimbursement or have their bill adjusted for them? Um, so it would have to be on a re reimbursement or a rebate program through the city if we did something along that line um, because it wouldn't be through ComEd. ComEd doesn't give us any type of um, accommodation for, for that. Um, this this uh, I have listed here because this question has come up you know, multiple times. So I looked at just surrounding towns that just you know, surround us and none of them offer a senior option. Um, none of them offer an option for churches or nonprofits to exempt them. Um, there were two that offered exemptions for government and that was Lamont and Lombard, but Lamont still has a vehicle sticker at $90, $96 per car. Wow. So they're getting both, uh, you know, both of those revenue sources there. They're not replacing it, but we're looking to replace it. We are not looking to keep this uh, labor intensive mm -hmm. um, project. You know, the, the biggest portion with the vehicle stickers is it's such an inconvenience to the residents uh, for them to come to City Hall or come to the police department and get these where utility tax makes it a no-brainer for them. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to come and get the sticker. They don't have to um, bother themselves with that. It would just be added right to their bill. They control how much usage they have in their home. They could shut off their lights. They could you know, lower their, um, you know, the temperature uh, in the wintertime. They can raise the temperature in the summertime. They can control their kilowatt hours that they use. So, so seniors would have a much lower rate <coughs> than a average household, which you know I would assume to be four people in a household. Seniors would be looking at a much lower um, amount. And they would be able to look at their ComEd bill, see exactly what kilowatt hours they used over the last year, and multiply it by the rates that you know we select as an option, divide that number by 100, and that would be their tax for that month. So you know there's a, a pretty simple calculation for them for you know anybody to be able to determine. But, you know, it is a volatile ta you know, tax for us because it's based on usage. We have a really hot summer, there could be additional revenue. We have a really cool summer, we would have less revenue. So you know, it, it is uh, you know, a tad volatile for us, but still I think a better um, option for us than the vehicle stickers. So Lisa, I, I have a question for you, please. Um, we've spoken um, on some ideas, because uh, we are starting to hear from residents. Um, and one particular resident is a senior. And although he's in favor of eliminating the sticker and going to some type of a utility tax, his concern was that it's not necessarily correct that perhaps all seniors um, uh, would use less um, utility, you know, electric and so forth. So their concern is that the cost to them to this senior has already um, voiced his opinion. It could be that others are thinking about it, but maybe haven't said anything. So I'm kind of talking in general that perhaps some of the others, um, residents, uh, seniors, or uh, family households with where there's a single a parent, you know, with children that is on a fixed income. So we're talking more of a fixed income family um, that it may a actually for them and especially a senior living already on the sticker to a nine dollar cost, whether they have whether they have one vehicle or, or two, um, the cost may be on the high end doing it this way. So, I guess we need to just ask ourselves if there's if the city is in a position to possibly do some type of rebate to um, a senior resident. Um, are we in a position to do that financially, you know, and things like that? So I, I'll, I'll just, this is just my opinion, right? Um, and I think one of the reasons that Lisa is appropriately presenting a bunch of options is we need to discuss this and see where, where we want to come out. Um, I obviously have my own opinions. Everybody else probably has their own as well. But um, one of the things, and in, in I've started with, with the budget already with Lisa too, is one of the things we always run into around budget time is you're going to see every department needs more heads, right? And, and frankly, as you talk to them, they're all justified, right? Public Works wants, wants a couple people. Um, you know, on Joe Finley's side, Amy wants people, police, administration, right? It all makes sense, but we can't fund all of that, right? Headcount is, is, a, is a very expensive, expensive cost to, to anybody. Um, one of the things we really need to concentrate on, in my mind, is efficiency. The same thing that my company is doing is get more out of the people you have, treat them well, pay them well, but get more out of them. And this is, these are the kind of things, right? To me, this is 
an absolute efficiency play, right? We're taking away 1,500 hours, is that what it is on the city sticker program? Hopefully, you know, that one, this one action doesn't really make a difference, but if we do this in two or three different ways, those people can then help out with police. They could help out Amy, you know, with paperwork, whatever it is, right? So one of my fears is that we do something that benefits the residents in a couple of different ways, benefits the city from an efficiency standpoint, and then we add something like a rebate program on that becomes pretty inefficient. So um, there are things we can do, and, and again, I am, I'm only one vote here, right? And, and, and we can go um, whichever way the majority decides to go. But I, I hesitate to do anything that's one-off, right? And one of the things that's, that's kind of surprised me over the couple of years I've been doing this is we always sit here and we get in like these odd situations. You say, well, how did we get here? Like, why are we at this point? Why are we negotiating on this or that? And it's always because, well, 10, 15 years ago, we tried to make one or two people happy and it, it got us into like this weird situation. And yes, it's absolutely possible that some people could pay more under this. I, I can tell you, um, we have car, two car stickers. I tried to kind of look at my ComEd bill. My family's gonna pay more doing this, right? We're above the average rate of ComEd. Uh, there is some convenience fee here that I'm, frankly, I'm willing to pay for my family and, and you know, we're in a position where we can afford it and, and some people do struggle a little bit more. But, you know, kind of balancing everything, I'm of the opinion that if we don't have to make exceptions that we, that we probably try not to make exceptions. So, um, yes, a senior could be paying only, you know, there's the example of a senior who only has one car now that pays $9 that maybe has a huge, old, inefficient house that pays more under this. Unfortunately, sometimes those huge, old, inefficient houses do cost a little bit more money, and, and it's not the popular thing to say, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that we need to go on an exception basis. Now, to what the mayor was kind of asking earlier, there's a separate way to exempt schools, right, or something like that, that is actually an automated way to do it. To me, that's a more open discussion that, that isn't wasting, not wasting, but isn't utilizing staff resources because when I asked about how do we give seniors rebates, the answers aren't that great, right? I mean, maybe they come here and they provide some sort of documentation and they sit with, I don't know, probably not Lisa, one of the water clerks or something like that, and then we cut them a check. I mean, you know, are, are we cutting them a check for $12 and it costing us $5 worth of time, money, cutting checks? I don't know the answer, but so I just want to be careful, and we can definitely have a difference of opinion here, but I want to make sure everybody understands what it means when we talk about manually rebating people, right? I, how that works, what we do, what the process is, and it's, it's not as easy as like the school side where we can set it up with ComEd to build differently. Um, and, and I think Lisa covered this really well, and now we're kind of at the discussion point of everybody kind of has their own opinions, their own you know, seniors, schools, efficient, you know, my big thing is trying to just become more efficient and, and get more bang for the taxpayer dollar, right? Even if we're, this is revenue neutral and we're not spending the $50,000 to administer the program, that's a win in my book. The other thing to keep in mind is, thankfully, we're earmarking this all for capital improvement projects. So this isn't Ben's travel to Las Vegas for the next convention fund or, or anything like that. This is... These are dollars that go back into the projects that we're funding in the capital improvement project. And so I, I don't know that anyone is in disagreement with that. I think you know. I think everyone feels the same way that something has to be done about these city, city stickers, and and it's great that and and our job is to look at the benefit of the city and as residents in a whole. Uh, we and I, I I get it. You know. Certain category, you know, of uh, families are, you know, they're little small groups here, and but although we have to think on a big scale, we do need to be careful also on how it, this is going to affect those that are on, on a fixed income. Okay, and 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 I know that we have to look out for the you know, best interests of every, everyone. Uh, it is a good idea. Even the person that you know took the time to contact me. Um, you know, it was a concern, you know, because he's a senior, and and so I, I needed to bring that out. That, you know, is there a way that perhaps it could be a, an accommodation of? And I'm not saying a, a, a check out at you know at the end of the year. Credit, you know, credit is good. You know that uh, they can apply towards um, you know a water bill or something. I don't know. I I'm just bringing it out there for discussion. 
If there's any way that um, s you know small groups can benefit from this also, that's great. If not, you know, well, you know, I wanted to bring it out there and um, you know for discussion. No, it's worth talking about. I mean, I, it, I wonder how it would, we don't have crystal balls, but I wonder how it would play out. If there's, I think Eric did a thought there was about 900 seniors in the community. Well, we have it. We have it in. We have it in our. Well, that's the number of stickers. That's not. Well, the number well, we have. I, I have a, com a couple of comments. Well, I was only going to say this. Let's say you do a rebate, right? And we say seniors are eligible for it. That means then they have to be proactive and come down here, which is really no more onerous than it was when they were getting their city stickers. But, I mean, let's say you have 900 seniors. Maybe 200 do it. Maybe 200 do it for the first three years. Three years from now, nobody's even going to know that you do rebates. Eventually, probably just wither away. Um, there's a possibility there'd be a huge, huge glut of, you know, 900 seniors pounding on the door wanting their $12. It's possible. And then it would become really onerous. I would agree with that. It would like almost be, a, um, you'd just be shifting the burden from the police department with city stickers over to the, you know, the water department where they'd be overwhelmed. Um, if we had a crystal ball and we saw that it was like going to be 50 people and eventually it dwindles down to three, um, you know, then it would be easy to offer that. Um, this is my only comment. I'm not kind of an answer. I'm just it, pointing it, it out. And this is just a fear that I actually haven't discussed with you guys. But you know, I think I'm on three budgets in a row where I've pushed back and pretty much forced us not to upgrade our accounting system, right? So to say, which you know, maybe you can blame me for this then, but to say maybe we have 100 residents and it takes 20 minutes per resident, whatever it is, that's fine. But th there's more to it than that to actually get them money, right? And and Lisa, you could tell me, and you might not even know, but I, I've seen these kind of things just on, you know, on the business side where it's like you're trying to accommodate all of a sudden, can we print checks? What's the process, right? Do you have to sign every check that goes out? What's the, yes. right? It, it's probably more than a 15 minute conversation with a resident. There's, my guess is we'll actually have to mail them a check afterwards. I doubt we're able to just hand over a handwritten yeah. check at the point, right? Right, we so don't issue cost checks. And time. It, it's just, it's a little more than just the coming down and talking that I'm afraid of, because you're right. If it's 10 minutes per resident and you just hand them over a, a handwritten check for 10 bucks, mm -hmm. not that big of a deal, but I, I'm afraid that there's a lot more to it on the operational so end. Well, we do put all checks that are issued in front of council for their approval before we issue them, so. Okay. You know, before check, we check continue, this. I don't know if Lisa, you had more on your PowerPoint. I, I don't want us to cut you off. I, so. No, I just, uh, I wanted us to discuss an option so that we can move forward with the ordinance because um, what we really do need to do is to have it in place by October 1st to achieve the revenue that we had in the budget for this year, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to, uh, if we could get this on the agenda in August so that we can get the ordinance into ComEd for them to get it in place for an October 1st start. So we just need council to determine what the option well, could you have more slides to, to present? Um, no. Oh, okay. I, I, I thought you still did. Okay. <laughs> I was like, we just started discussing, and yeah. before well, Lisa, it's, I was like, we cut her off. Kind of it's jumping. absolutely a, a healthy debate, and, um, you know, I, I think Jason's comments are, are true in regards to, um, yes, it is. we are, we are uh, capable of doing some remaining back to the seniors. I think you do lose some efficiencies that we're trying to gain by doing that. Um, it's easier to work with ComEd and get the dozen schools or churches or whatever it may be um, with their account numbers in advance and they'll never see this tax and so really this is a replacement tax on the residents um, to remove the stickers um, you know the average if you look at this slide here the average impact um, some people may be affected by a few dollars some people may save a few dollars and I think it's impossible to make a blanket statement across the community it's going to be different for everyone based on their usage you know, typically um, seniors do use less electricity, but not always, so you can't use that example either. But, um, you know, again, we are looking for some um, feedback. The reason we are asking to do this is usually, and now, is that usually we start ordering materials for stickers. So if we're not going to do this, we need to get going on, you know, the, the reverse, which I don't think anyone necessarily wants to do. But we did, we do book revenue for new stickers at the end of the year in this fiscal. So that's why we're asking to keep this moving along so we can select an option as far as the amount um, and a process as far as who's in and who's out. And so that we can receive that revenue in this fiscal that we budgeted for. Does this, these numbers, these options, does these include business? No, these are, these are just, uh, what I'm showing you is just for, uh, for residents. So, so if we did option five, the truth is, with business coming added to this, we probably wouldn't be 
a little under, you'd probably come up a little over. Right, right. The, the yeah. average resident would less, but the city would get a little more. Yeah, we, we focused on the, the resident impact. That was kind of how it was pre-sold you know, prior last year. So we were trying to show exactly what the impact to the residents are. There is uh, a potential gain with uh, new commercial accounts, obviously without the schools and churches. But yes, we the, again, the city should come ahead um, a little bit, which will help us do a lot of our programs. I was unable to get the business information from ComEd. I did try on multiple occasions, but um, it was just not something that they were um, comfortable releasing to me. Okay. So. Um, I, I wasn't able to do projections. I can, you know, estimate based on, you know, our resident usage, but, um, you know, I'm not comfortable doing that as much as, you know, I am using the figures that I have from ComEd telling me in the last 12 months how much our residents used and what that would convert to in, in revenue or potential revenue for the city. Okay. So. I, I have a couple of comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking along those same lines as, as uh, Jason and, um, and had we had this gone to vote a year ago, I would have uh, voted yes uh, for, for that. Um, I, I kind of understand, but not really the whole um, seniors thing. You know, I'm 55 now. I'm at the pre-senior stage. And um, it's really, it's, it's, it's a really hard argument for me to accept when uh, seniors have received, over the age of 65 have for many, 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 many years, only had to pay nine dollars. They have um, when when I've had to pay eighteen. Okay, so they they have benefited for being sixty-five years and older. Um, we're only talking thirteen percent of all the vehicle stickers sold in uh, twenty fifteen were sold to at, at the nine dollar rate. So we're talking a minority. A significant minority um, and of that 13% it's gonna take a lot of evidence for me to see that anybody within that 13% um, is unable to afford an extra 15 to 20 dollars a year I did my I did mine I'm not even close to the 9456 kilowatt hours. I'm at it's about 7,200. I gave Lisa my numbers. Uh, okay. I'm 2,000 kilowatt hours a year. I'm just my wife and I, just two people. Okay. And so we're the seniors that are the empty nesters. And so we're living this whole uh, so 2,000, 2,000 fewer hours. Okay. My numbers at two cars, I mean, I, at two cars at, at the highest rate at 6.628, I was still only a couple of dollars off of what I'm currently paying at $36. Uh, we get anything lower than that, then, I'm, then, then I was even, and we get to around uh, the 80%. Um, I, was, I was under. Um, I, 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 get, I get this, I, I just don't accept that all seniors out there are poor and they can't afford it. And we always hear this, what about the seniors? It's not that I don't care about the seniors, but it kind of gets old when it's what about us? Because what we do is we pander or they pander to us because of their age. And I don't think that's right, that we have to make exceptions for a specific group that I know darn well can afford this. They can afford the extra dollar and a half to two dollars a month, and if they have two cars, they're coming out even. That's just my point. So whatever we, we agree with, okay, and I'm good with option two, three, or four. I'm not good with option one. I'm not good with option five. I'm not good with option two, three, or four. And for the majority of the residents of the city of Lockport that have three or four cars, they're going to come out ahead. And we have to look at the majority who is really going to affect the people that really need the help are the people that have the kids and have the cars at home, and we need to look at them as versus a small minor, uh, the minority, and of the minority, the 13 percent. What are we talking about? One or two percent of the people can't afford the extra two dollars a month. I just don't buy it. All right, email Brian yeah. to Jim. Kind of chime in a little bit. A lot of uh, already said. I mean, there's been a lot of good points here. Um, I know we talked about this for a little bit of time. You're
forward to it that should be put doing something else. Like, uh, I know just like even with the police department, I'm a little bit familiar with. Is you know, uh, if you ran a plate or say they were stopped for a traffic, you would say, you know, did they buy the city sticker? You know, I mean, that's just one thing on their mind. The officer, did they, you know, maybe check for a city sticker back there? Well, I think there's more important things to check and keep in your mind versus uh, did they get their city sticker? There's other things that they could be thinking of. And that's why, to me, knowing that part of what goes behind, I know in the police department, I think that's that's a huge thing for me, knowing of what they have to think of. Um, again, I, I think it's, it, you know, just from my own, own experience, you know, you're scraping off this sticker in the wintertime, putting it on in the wintertime, you know, getting the razor blade. I think there's a lot of work, effort, to do this sticker, believe it or not. I think there's there's work involved. Um, the other part is driving here. Again, that, that's been said. So I think there's work involved in this little sticker on your window. Um, you know, looking at some of these options, I, I'm pretty much open to, you know, one through five. I, I can see some points to all these. But um, I'm leaning right now to, like, option three and four. Uh, I think uh, it kind of looks to be like the middle of the road, uh, something that I think uh, is doable, I guess. Again, I, I think if we had some dialogue and three and four looks good to me. Um, I know we talked about the exempting the, the churches and the government schools. Um, I, I could go with that. I think that shows some, some good good faith that, hey, we're trying to work with them and we know our schools are struggling or if, as far as financially or getting money from state. And, and I know our, church, our churches are too. So I think those would be some good things to uh, maybe uh, look to the future or adopt this and then maybe work that in. I'm not sure if that's know something to talk about I think we could um, but again I'm leaning to, to the option of three and four <coughs> Jim what do you get uh, let me start with a quick question the, the two vehicle stickers was that like a hard number like we know there's X amount of vehicles divided by X amount of well, we know we had houses we sold 15,000 vehicle stickers last year how many we have about 10,000 households okay. just under 10,000 households just under two average it, and part of that is let me start with for me getting rid of the vehicle sticker I'm, I'm on board I, we've got no problem with that the discussion and seniors or so there's for me I'm with Jason in terms of efficiency getting this as an efficient like we're talking about planning and zoning let's get Lockport back on track and get everything efficient as possible and let's let's do the main stream if we can save hours from the police department and everything like that we can use those uh, uh, um, you know other places that's great I, I'm, I'm all for that 100% um, if we do look at you know so part of that argument is if we do look at seniors there are there's money that we're technically leaving on the other side of the table and I'll say you know somebody like a Pete Colorelli in a couple of years that may have 10 people <laughs> 10 kids with 10 cars that we're losing all this money in vehicle stickers for a family like that so there's the opposite spectrum that <laughs> gonna fund our capital improvement plan <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, I think we could wait a little bit yeah. and Pete's family can tell um, so for me is you know you're looking at that average that is much more efficient we look at Lockport as a whole and we proceed forward efficiently um, the other diagram showed, if you go down one, Lisa, in terms of, uh, no, 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 down, down, the, like which five. ones were charging states versus, or for states and churches mm -hmm. and stuff like that. To me, again, this is more of an efficiency thing for me. Most of these people are, are not charging, not doing anything different for seniors or churches or government. That, to me, when you start getting into other government entities, churches, nonprofits, you may get into a slippery slope of people now starting to come and plead their case of, hey, you know, we have some some need also, please start abating us there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, as an average throughout, I'd rather go on the lower end of spectrum of the taxes that doesn't hurt people as much than, than try to exempt certain people, certain companies, certain churches and everything like that. Um, so if there's just a small impact on everyone, then that that makes things work out better for that and, and whatever we decide as a whole is what option it is that that's where I'm kind of leaning towards is you know the more efficient we can get with the process so we're not exempting people we're not trying to have those arguments we're just being fair across the board no matter what it is and then going forward that way 
Mayor, if I get go ahead. Just some uh, additional comments. We're looking at one issue. Uh, we recently voted on the RPZ valve. Now, I've had quite a few residents because in my ward, in my subdivision, there's a lot of sprinkler systems. Well, many of the residents who have the RPZ valve, they got charged from the plumber an extra $15. So all of us up here will say, well, it's only $15. But here is the perspective that I'm hearing from the residents. It's an extra $5 here, $10 here. Groceries are going through the roof. So everyone's getting nickel and dimed left and right, forward, backwards. So we may say it's only a couple dollars here, a few dollars here, but if you look at the big picture, people are sick and tired of a few dollars here and a few dollars there. That's what I heard. And it kind of reminded me the reason why I ran six years ago. So it kind of put me back in my place. So any of these options would be the lowest option, in my opinion, uh, that I, I would accept with the opportunity, not only an exception just for seniors, but Darren hit on the point, why only seniors? Why can't we just have a potential exemption where someone could come in, hey, I was negatively impacted on this. It should be applied to everyone. Now, as far as efficiencies are concerned, yeah, we may not be as efficient as we want, but I believe not every single resident will come in to get the rebate because of the convenience. So I th as far as efficiency, we may be spending $50,000 a year to administer the vehicle sticker program from the police department. We may not spend the $50,000 a year to get that rebate back to the residents. So that's a lot of the feedback I've been getting recently. My wife, she's been keeping track of our expenses for the last eight years, and we're pretty frugal family. And she has the numbers to prove it. Every single year, our expenses are going up $2,000. And we don't spend money. We just spend money on the essentials. And we're talking a few dollars here, a couple dollars here. It all adds up, homeowners, auto, groceries, gas even though it's lower than than last year but people are feeling the the pinch so that's just a few comments i wanted to to but institute this, but yeah, we should look I at i couldn't disagree with this, this but this isn't on top of the vehicle stickers this is replacing vehicle stickers i i agree and, but and, i'm talking we, about when the we individuals do, when we who do, will have a negative impact we should be giving them the opportunity to get a rebate if they're negatively impacted. Well, that's they're not that's be negatively my point. Impacted. It, it, anybody is, anybody that will, with one penny more than they paid over the 18, uh, 18 or the uh, 46 dollars or whatever, whatever it is, 18, <coughs> 36 plus 18, uh, 54 dollars. And if they're paying 54 dollars and one cents, then they're going to be negatively impacted. So are we going to re rebate them a penny? If they so choose to come in, yeah, you're That's using ridiculous. extreme. That's ridiculous. You're using an extreme example, no, but I'm we should be I'm giving using, them using, the opportunity I'm to use it. One penny more is it was we've come on hard to. And, and this you think is the normal is, resident would actually come in for for a penny? No, well, this no, but, using an extreme this is example. This the poor senior th discussion. I'm not talking about any the just the poor senior. I'm talking about the general public. Well, look, let me. Uh, yeah, I'll give you guys my perspective on this. Yes, you know, my, my goal for this was just to get rid of it. I didn't want it. But I also understood that we passed a $48 million capital improvement plan that is a serious plan. We're, we're not like other cities that have decent infrastructure. We're an old city that had big problems. And so, you know, I understand that we just can't get rid of the revenue. We, I just wanted to replace it. Um, when it, uh, and the only reason I dropped it last time, I didn't bring it back on the agenda, was I didn't want to take our tax put it on a, another municipality like fire, like school, so then all of a sudden they're in a position where they have to raise their levy. Because then all I'm doing is like, hey, look at us, we lower taxes, and then I stick it to the poor school district who has to raise their levy. So I wasn't interested in doing that, because it still goes back to the residents. Um, I you know, asked Lisa, make sure you find a way, if there's a way that we can exempt, you know, uh, you know, some of these groups like schools, churches, I, I think it is important to me. Um, 
uh, we have a, just a few nonprofits, maybe SOS Village, maybe the food pantry or something. I mean, there's a few nonprofits that I, I have no problem working that into. And quite honestly, I, I'm, all, I'm all for the option number five. I'd actually hopefully save some people a little bit of money. And with the fact that we're putting this, this goes into business now, that'll be revenue that we haven't collected yet. So I see it as um, ultimately doing us a little better but even if it, in the end we just broke even and got rid of the vehicle sticker tax, I'd consider it a success. Um, and I believe, although it shifts to business now, there's some new taxes for them, we're very much competitive with all our neighbors. It's not like we're suddenly putting ourselves at a disadvantage for Romeoville, who continues to go gangbusters with you know uh, industrial growth and stuff like that. Nobody's squawking over there about their, you know, this rate. And we're still not gonna be as high as them if we did option five. Me personally, I'm for exempting the nonprofits and, and the other governmental bodies and actually, quite frankly, doing option five. I'd actually like to try to save people a little money if it's possible. Um, I actually contemplate, I was actually kind of on board with doing exemptions for seniors, but you're right, it could be, it could be a mayhem. And I guess, you know, maybe the bottom line is this. If we find that it's really problematic and, you know, a year goes by and seniors are clamoring, it's, we can always reconsider putting in a rebate, maybe by then, We'll have the software that Jason keeps cutting out, and uh, maybe it'll be easier to be able to find ways to do the rebate without having to just write checks or something. So um, that's just my feeling. That's where I'm at. I'm one voice on the council, though. Or maybe we could do the opposite, institute the rebate, and then revisit it a year later. Like if it just becomes holy yeah. moly, we've got 900 people in here yeah. wanting $5. One of the, Mayor, if I could chime in a little bit, um, one of the reasons we, ch we chose this is that it's a um, what we call a consistent, reliable revenue source, um, and it's balanced. And what I mean by that is uh, you have a percentage of seniors that get discounts. You have other residents that don't. You have some people that have um, you know different amounts of cars. Um, but we also have a percentage of people that have noncompliance. I mean, we do have, I think enforcement would tell you, we do have residents that choose not to apply or participate, and if we catch them, great, we get the money, but if we, we don't, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know what the percentages are, but out of, you know, per household, this seems to be a very balanced revenue um, that is kind of sp spread out over the town and now potentially businesses. Um, so that's kind of why we went down the utility taxes. We felt it was the most balanced revenue replacement for the stickers. Um, you know, hearing some of the debates, I, I think, we, you know, Lisa, I, Lisa and I have discussed, you know, option three and four is something the staff was recommending, but, um, you know, we're, we're open to this discussion, I think has been great and healthy, and I, I think we're looking for some, you know, just to kind of wrap up this discussion a little bit as, as staff is looking for just a little uh, final direction in regards to which option to kind of tie up into language in, in regards to a resolution. And, which groups should we, um, you know, I don't, do we need language in the resolution to absolve those groups? So, yes. you know, we would need to know if seniors are in or out and we sounds like seniors, government. We can't put seniors in their ordinance. Oh, correct, yeah. But, they all um, claim they live in a church. Yeah, mm -hmm. government and church, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any way we can find out the, the impact to any of the schools or churches or anybody who may ask for that exemption? I mean, if we're talking it's a $500 increase per year or is this a five thousand or fifty thousand dollar increase? I don't know. I think how much this each is one also is actually different. a sliding tax, right? So the more you use after you get past, the less, the less you get taxed. Two thousand what? Two thousand kilowatt hours. The tax actually right. reduces right. dramatically, right? right. So so thirty three C could be, is going to use something. I think we're talking about hundreds of dollars, not thousands, but. Mm -hmm. If it's only hundreds of dollars, I'm saying, yeah. so th again, that the efficiency in going through with that. And then the churches are different also. So how yeah. much are they using? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. You could make that case on individual groups all over the town. You 20, 24,000 kilowatt hours in a year. Okay. That's five years and the four and a half years of use in my house. Right. But d does a school go through that? Yeah. And, oh, we no may, but then, but, that, then it, but then it drops it almost. Just time. to have that information. Because but, I'm seeing all the but other. I'm all for exempting, exempting schools, churches, and nonprofits. So can, can I make a proposal? Right, I, I think we've had some good discussion, some maybe a little bit of hyperbole, but you know, I, I think I'm hearing option five for most people, two to four from others. You know, where I kind of came in, where we've talked about a couple times, I'll, I'll propose. You know, and again, I'm, I'm one vote. We go option four with the. Um, 
exemption for schools and churches. And, 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 and nonprofits. Not I think many. that gets a little slippery because I don't, you know, I, okay, frankly, schools. I was on the board of the school, like, but like, it's so not that big of a deal, right? I don't, I don't care either way, right? I'm just, okay. I'm just talking, but. All right, that's fine. Let's that's just do a quick, right, let, Joanne, what's your feeling? Well, um, I wanted to ask, so once you make a decision, uh, uh, the board makes a decision on which option, are we stuck to that um, option? No, no, well, I mean, what we're going to do today, basically, is throw your, throw your, what your feeling is. And then we'll, you know, we'll bring this up on committee the whole next, uh, the next meeting. You'll get your feedback, um, and then we can then make a firm decision on what we want to do, and then put it on city council meeting in time after. That still gives us enough time to get it passed in time. Yeah, that's that's enough. Of, if we need another meeting to discuss again. Okay, I would say that because we don't. We, I think we're all in agreement. I think Jim no wants stickers. to know like how much is this going to cost the schools. He wants to know before he's ready to do exemptions. What's fair? Now would you would you not just, just a question, Jim? And, and Jim and I talked about this, and I think we're pretty closely aligned. But so say we go out and get a number from 33C or any school, right? Regardless of what that is, whether it's more or less than we than you may have in your head, whatever that is, would that change your opinion on whether we give them an exemption? It, it might, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Then it's probably uh, worth having before you make it. And Joanne, I'm sorry, you probably weren't done. Well, uh, I, I wanted to also ask: regular businesses are not exempt from this. We're just talking about schools and um, you know non churches yes. and nonprofits, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So businesses are still in this particular. Okay. Still included. Because I'm, I'm. The goal is obviously as we grow and we have businesses. You know that this will be, um, you know, a, a revenue to the city. Um, it's not just a burden on the residents. Right now, it just seems like a lot of these things are a burden on the residents because we don't have <coughs> businesses that uh, will carry the the burden for us. Mm -hmm. So, in my opinion, um, you know, I I just to be on the safe side, I have to caution. Is option five is what I'm, you know, I'm thinking. Okay, Bob, would, um, would you have to something to say? Mr. Mayor, members. And did you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, because there's a state statute that controls how this tax is imposed by all Illinois municipalities, we do have to follow the restrictions in it, and there are built-in exemptions for units of local government and school districts, and I think that's why you saw some of our neighboring communities have built that into their ordinances. But if you do an exemption for seniors, for example, it sounds like that may not. We may not be going down that path. That's where the rebate program comes in, but there is no exemption in the state statute for churches and not-for-profits. If we were to allow um, a, an exemption for those entities, it would have to be through a rebate program similar to what we discussed mm. for seniors. Okay, so churches and nonprofits have to have a rebate, whereas municip other governmental municipalities can just be don't have to. Okay. Correct. We have no choice but to have a rebate program instituted. You might as well just expand it a bit. And not every resident is going to utilize it. Dude, there's a big difference should, between yeah. 15 churches and 500 and seniors, agree. man. And I agree, but everyone should be given the choice and the opportunity. All right, so that's fine. So Bob is, Bob's number what? With exemptions well, it, for? It, it, it has to have the rebate opportunity. Yeah. For me. Okay, I'm with you. So, so it has to be the lowest. So number five with rebates and and for still everybody. the okay and with for everybody so that means the schools and churches can come in and will automatically give exemptions to the schools or not the schools the municipal the government other schools or other yeah, municipalities schools you know, yeah. fire yeah. protection district okay. park districts all the units of local <clears throat> government that's what we're trying not to think. right okay can you clarify that please, Tom, they're automatically exempt only we have to specify. We have to specify in the ordinance that we are exempting units of local government and school districts. As That's, a whole? Yes. Not it's, a, it's across the board. You're not allowed to pick and choose schools, but not park district, for example. So um, this chart that's up right now that Lisa put on there, that is saying that Plainfield, or Plainfield and Lenox, all these people pretty much did, did not exempt Correct. The local government. Right. It Only looks like Lamont, Lamont and Lombard did, correct. Right. right. I mean, you can do units of local government and you can do school districts. That's what's allowed by the statute as far as exemptions. Okay. Um, uh, what I was wondering is it, in town, I know we have some uh, private schools. Do they get an exemption because they're a school? 
No, I don't think so. I think or it's, it's only just the, the public schools that would get an exemption the under the statute. The statute uses the term school district. I'll look into it, but I'm, po I'm relatively certain that it would only be public schools. Public schools. Okay. okay. That is a local yeah. unit of government. All right. All right. And then, so, Joanne, do you have a, a, a feeling now for where you're at generally? Option five. Okay. Number five with rebates for seniors or for all? or just the exemptions for governmental bodies? Really with the option for exemption. Okay, so same as Bob. Yes. Okay. And Darren? I'm, uh, I'm for option uh, four or five. Option four, option four is exactly other than it, where it's one one thousandth of a difference from what we would have, would have passed a year ago with the only exception from a year ago was uh, uh, governmental bodies whatever yep. Tom just said. Okay. You know, that was the only difference. It would have passed a year ago. We wouldn't be having this, this discussion right now. Yeah. So so I'm, I'm all for option four. Okay. That's good. All right. And then, uh, Brian, what do you got? Yeah, I'll go with option four, too. Uh, I don't know if it's exempt for the uh, Okay. Okay. Just exemptions. And Jim said he's option number one with uh, <laughs> absolutely no exemption. Is there a, a point? Oh, is that what? Yeah. That's right. There's a development. I love to help, but uh, depending on where local governments are, what schools are actually spending on it, if there's a hardship, a technical hardship, I mean, if it's, again, if it's a small amount, then let's keep it efficient and just forget the exemptions, okay. go forward, and uh, I, I'd be fine with four. Okay, so number four, possibly no exemptions, but you're going to find out after we get a little bit more info. Okay, and me personally, I'm at, I'm at option five with uh, um, exemptions for the uh, the other governmental bodies. Like I said, I don't want to pass it on to them. And uh, I do, I think in the end, the rebate thing will really be onerous. Excuse me, Mayor. Um, can we just have clarification? Um, on these uh, uh, towns, Plainfield and Lu New Lenox and Romeoville that um, did not give any exemptions, was, are these all home, um, home rule? Um, I believe, yes. I think yes. Plainfield probably I think might. I do believe Lamar. they're all home rule, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that, that makes a big difference too. They're making the decision without uh, really Manhattan. having to go to the body, you know, the government, or on referendum. Well, this isn't referendum. No, no, referendum. no, and we're not, we're not, I understand, because yeah. that's how, why we're getting around it. But I mean, I, just to understand, these are home rule um, towns. Yeah, okay. The only one I'm not sure about is Manhattan. They're pretty small. Yeah, right. Everybody else, I think. Lamont, are they above 25 million? No. No, but I th no. think they got it by referendum. But are they home They get that well, wicked $96 okay. dollar per car. Holy oh, smokes. Yeah. <coughs> they're getting both ways. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And a high, yeah. High All right, so everybody's, we have a general feeling where everybody's at. Uh, we'll hear from residents over the next two weeks. Uh, let's reconvene this discussion and make a decision where we want to be um, at the next Committee of the Whole, and then we could put it on the agenda. So you want me to reach out to the school, so a couple of the schools to find out what. How yeah, if you get that information hours. for Jim and, and for all of us, so District 92, yeah. it's on there. Homer yeah, 33 the whole C. range of the, the public schools that are in our, you know, 33C District 92. Just for their schools that are it's like 33C is whatever's in actual Lockport that would. All right, we uh, we good then? Okay, thanks. Thank thanks you. for the discussion, everyone. It was good. All right, let's move on. Uh, it was good, good discussion. Where we at? Oh, uh, auxiliary officer. Harry, you want to take this? Uh, Mayor, council members, uh, uh, the police department's asking that we uh, change the uh, ordinance that allows us to have uh, 10 auxiliary officers and we're asking that uh, you expand that to 15. The uh, auxiliary program here in Lockport's a long standing successful program. Um, Alderman Smith was a uh, auxiliary officer for many years. We have officers, auxiliary officers that have been on over 35 years. And auxiliary officers are unpaid volunteers. And I believe volunteerism is something that we're promoting here in town. Um, with the increase in the community events, uh, we believe that we'll have more of a need for auxiliary officers. Um, auxiliary officers are not conservators of the peace. They don't have the right to make an arrest and they have to be in the presence of a regular police officer. Um, so, um, again, we are proposing that uh, we expand that from 10 to 15. Harry, uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. can you explain, like, 
what are the requirements? Anybody in the community can say, I want to be an auxiliary officer. What are the requirements? Is there a physical requirement? Is there, uh, do they just get called up on any time? They have to be at the ready on call all the time? What is, how does that? No, uh, again, they're volunteers. Uh, they're, they do have to pass a background check. The uh, physical requirements are not as stringent mm -hmm. as a regular police officer. They still have to attend a auxiliary academy. So, um, yeah, any citizen can apply and they don't even have to be a Lockport resident. And they're called on pretty scheduled events or if well, there's an emergency, they, you ask if they're available? They work, basically they work Christmas crossroads, they do Canal Day, they do our festivals, but they also ride around with our officers. So they bolster the um, officer safety of our, of our officers and regular patrols. hit on a lot of the bullet points that an officer goes through. So you understand uh, you know, the responsibilities or what to look for when there's traffic stops or something like that. So you get a little bit of a background of an officer but not the full, uh, the full scale that they go through. So it's a little bit of, of that. Uh, and again, I, I know they, um, they'll help with, uh, as Terry stated, uh, Chief Fleming stated that uh, help with the traffic control, special events, stuff like that. If there happened to be a, maybe a car accident or something like that, we may go sit at the intersection. Weather related, emergencies. Well, there's a, there's a multitude of things that, uh, that comes on that list of uh, maybe some like, things that they could help out with some city activities. So so for yeah. you, did you retire, or just give it up? Did you get yeah. kicked off? Give it up, just gave <laughs> off. Couldn't yeah. pass the physical? <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know. All that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, it was, I'll tell you what, it was a really a lot of fun. actually a good time. Is there it's terms? If somebody does it, they have to do it for? No term. So you we can have, go through that training and they can be gone in six months? Well, we send them for annual training as well. They have to um, um, qualify with a weapon as well. Yeah, there is the cost is like, a, um, there is a cost for the training, right? No, there's no cost to the training, but their vest costs $800, and the equipment, other equipment is 700 so it's $1,500. So plan. for us to get a, a, well, I would say this. Um, and by the way, I asked the chief to, to look into doing this because, I, I, frankly, I, I think it's great and we can use them for the increased festivals we do. But um, I would think if we're going to spend 1500 bucks on a guy, you should at least obligate him for a year or That's something. what I was you know? kind of asking. Uh, like yeah, instead of just doing it and saying, eh, I'm done. <clears throat> sure. Okay. And, and uh, the money comes out of our federal seizure. It doesn't come out of our general fund. So keep smoking, people, right? All right. <laughs> I, I don't keep getting caught. <laughs> years ago, I don't know what time has changed, but there was, we had to have a, a writing requirement so many hours a month. We had to meet with the officers. And, uh, so we just kind of kept up, kind of kept our skills up, too, a little bit by doing that. So we're a little bit more alert. And, uh, you know, so that worked out real good. So that's, we kind of worked really well. A any negative effects in the general police department? Do they feel like, oh, who are these auxiliary guys? Does it bother them with overtime? I don't think so. Um, uh, I honestly don't believe that. I haven't heard anything like that. They, the officers look at that as an extra person to back them up. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Everybody okay with this? Moving forward with this? Okay. I, we, if we could put it on the consent agenda then to increase to 15. Doesn't mean we're going to have 15, but it's open for volunteers. So. But with the commitment also. Not that. Yeah, and, and I would like to put like a uh, maybe, maybe a 12 month commitment to that. <clears throat> Not okay. that anybody would back up, but okay. in case. All right, very good. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, renewals. Van, Tom, when are you guys taking this? I'll take that one. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, uh, the city has a longstanding lease with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources for five lots <clears throat> that comprise part of the commuter parking lot at the train station. The uh, last time the city council approved the lease was in 2010. It was a five-year lease. Uh, it expires on August 31st of this year. Uh, what's before you uh, for consideration is the renewal of the lease. Uh, the only term that's being changed is the state is asking to increase the rent 
by or the, uh, the lease amount by $100 per year for a total of $1,400 per year, uh, $7,000 over the full five-year term. Uh, the, set, the staff is recommending approval, and if you are so inclined to uh, move forward with it, we'd put it on the next uh, agenda. So it's going to cost us an extra $1,400? No, uh, no, an extra $100 a year. So it's a total of $1,400 per year. Right now it's uh, $1,300 per year. I'm sorry. Oh, right. oh I see. So it's going okay. $1,300 to $1,400. Okay, I got you. All right. Um, related to that, did you get, did that guy Kirk get a hold of you? Did you, I sent you that email about the other way of paying at the commuter lot? Did you see that? Yeah. Is that feasible? Um, yeah, there, there's software available and different things we can explore. We looked at it once in the past, but we're going to revisit the options with the equipment we have and see if there's some, some uh, ways that we can work with that. I, I bring that up because I'm, as far as the station, trying to make it a nice tight station. I know Romanville's going to put one in. We want to make sure that ours is, is easy to use. There's these pay stations that are kind of a pain in the neck. So there's ways to do it with apps so people don't have to run all the way to one end of the parking lot, put money in a box, and then run on the train. They just do it on their app. So. Anyways, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll research it more. I mean, that was a new one that we hadn't heard of, but in the past, that there was a fairly heavy expense to get everything up and going, and then maybe it'll pay off in a long run. But okay. um, we'll revisit all those in, in this company too. Okay. All right. Well, as far as this goes, um, anybody have any questions? Mayor. Yeah. It, the only question I have, and I don't know if Ben was able to talk to them, but it was more of the the, the money that we're putting in for the haunted house and the road for IDNR, and we're improving their area. And then we're seeing this when there's an increase of $100. Not that $100 is a lot for what we're doing, but if there's more of cooperation between governmental facilities to say, hey, we're, we're doing this for you, why are you raising the rent for us? <laughs> That's possible. If it were a local body of government, like if it were the park district, it'd say, hey, Sue, what's going on? IDNR? Are you kidding me? It's the black hole, man. <laughs> Having this conversation over $100? That was something to ask, and I don't know if yeah. you got a hold of it, it would be if it were actually a conversation you could have. But <laughs> trying to find the right person to talk to in Springfield, but hey, why are you giving me a $100 increase? I just built a road. Right. It, it blew my mind when I saw it. I'm like, we just spent, we're spending yeah. $125,000. How rude. Dollars. Yeah. Why are we even talking about this? That's because most people in IDNR don't even know we're doing the road. They have no idea, what the, honestly. <laughs> That's my experience, having met them last week. All right. Uh, so are we, are we good then? We have to do a consent agenda? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, what else we got? Amy. Hi. This is just a verbal update of uh, three projects that we are currently closing out. Uh, the 4th Street reconstruction, the 10th, 10th and Jefferson reconstruction, and the 2015 resurfacing project. Um, all three of these projects, um, Two of them, uh, actually one of them started last year. Uh, the 10th and Jefferson Street project started last year and um, was held over over the winter um, and to be finished in the spring. Um, the other two projects were awarded at the beginning of the year and uh, are near completed right now. Uh, there may be a few punch list items remaining, but we are finalizing the final quantities to get these projects closed out. Um, in the memo, I provided a spreadsheet showing the awarded contract amount um, and um, the um, the final cost of the project. Um, the fourth street reconstruction project numbers are final final. Um, the 2015 resurfacing project in 10th and Jefferson are near final. We have not agreed to final quantities on these contracts with the contractor, but they're very close. Um, so as you can see, um, the difference in the awarded versus actual numbers for the capital roadway line item, um, we are actually under by $242,000. Um, but the water and sewer difference in the projects, um, we are over by $58,000. Um, the biggest portion of this overage um, was, the, was the 4th Street reconstruction project and uh, had to do with um, unknown water connections that were discovered um, during construction. Um, and also um, service lines that were not shown um, on the plan set that needed to be connected at the shopping center. Um, these expenses accounted for nearly $48,000 of overage expenses. Um, these 
items need to be reconnected immediately to keep a water service uninterrupted and therefore cannot await for a council approval of a change order. Another large contributor to the additional water sewer cost was the reconstruction of a collapsed sewer main and manhole on 4th Street. Uh, this issue was discovered while reviewing the red zone televising tapes that came in later than expected and needed to be added at the last minute before the pavement was installed. At the conclusion of these three projects, the capital fund expenditures are under the award amount by 242000 and the water and sewer fund expenditures are over by about 59000 this is just for information. Anybody have any questions? No, it's, uh, it's a lot of work going on, so it'll be good. So even though some of those projects are, are under the um, awarded price, they're still over in, in budgeted, so we're gonna have a budget amendment to clean up all of this stuff here in the, probably the next month. Mm -hmm. So we'll wrap up some of those projects that we thought we were gonna end up last year, ended up rolling over to this year. We didn't budget for them in this year. We're going to button up all that stuff. Amy and I are going to meet up here in the next week and, and finish up all those. So there will be some budget amendments that you'll see um, just to make sure that we're in line. So it's good that we're coming in under the award, but we are coming in over what we budgeted for on some of these projects. So. Okay. All right. Any questions there? Crew? Okay. And then uh, who's going to take uh, Joe's? Uh, Mayor, I, I will. Um, we've had uh, Joe's not here. Obviously, he's dealing with a loss in his family and... Um, you know, city and staff, everyone offers their condolences to him and his family, and we wish him the best. Um, so I'd like to handle this first one, and I think I'm going to have Jack uh, handle the Emerald Ash Borer report. So um, the next item on your agenda here is the uh, disposal of a surplus vehicle, truck number 705. Uh, a prior council, we did uh, decide that we were going to replace that vehicle, and uh, we'll be purchasing a new Ford. Um, and we just have to, it's a technicality that we have to uh, take this to auction and we have to pass a resolution. Um, so we'd like to recommend to go to consent on this one. Unless you have any other questions. No, it's fine. Just consent. Everybody good? Yep. All right. There's a report there from Rusty, the city mechanic, and it's in pretty bad shape, so not much value. And then I'll have uh, Jack give you an update in regards to uh, the EAB. Thank you, Mayor Council. I kind of wanted to roll today, so I told him I'd take this on. <laughs> right. So, uh, Joe and Joe kind of wanted to provide an update for you guys on sort of what's been happening with the Emerald Ash Board and provide it to residents too, because uh, we get a lot of questions. Um, looking back, kind of in from 2013 to 2014, um, you know, we had requests for services of 230. Uh, ash trees that were marked in 2013. 2014 went up to 363. So residents, it is something that's a concern to them to try to find, you know, we get a lot of questions. Um, so we just want to provide some information. We are out there uh, so far. Um, there's been, <coughs> looks like uh, we've done 850 ash trees of our total about 2,400 that have been planned. So we're getting through it. It, it is going to take a few years. Um, but one thing that we do have that we're trying to get out there and it hasn't caught on as popular as it should is our 50-50 uh, match program for tree replacement. So if we do take down a parkway tree, we re our uh, arborist goes in and says, you know, what we're going to replace it with. Well, the residents, if they want to kind of change what they want, they want a different type of tree, we have a list of approved trees on our website. Um, they can do so and we'll match the cost 50-50 up to $175. So, so far this year, as of June, we've had 15 trees we've replaced that way. Um, so we haven't spent much of the budget at all. So one thing that I want to do and, you know, we're going to kind of look at is try to get the PR out there a little bit more so people know that it's an option and, you know, if they do have a new tree, there's a lot of really interesting trees here that they could replace it with. Okay. We can make, also a, make a little Facebook post and we're starting yeah. to get a good following. So is this, yeah. this, is, this is posted on the website right now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a section I on get EAB. This question all the time. Yeah, I, I do too. <laughs> we can put maybe uh, more emphasis into where it is, or put a link on the homepage landing or something. Um, the other thing you can do with this is typically our crews will come in, remove dangerous trees or ones that are dying or more obviously need to be done. You know, priority. Um, we won't necessarily come back and replace that tree right away. I mean, we, it's kind of a, we can remove them faster than we can replant them. So if there's a, a resident um, watching that uh, is tired of waiting, they're, they're on the list, they're going to get another tree. But if they want to 
put in some money and do the 50-50 program, they can work that out sooner and faster with their part of their own dime if they're tired of waiting for the next tree that comes along. But oh, yeah. but so I same with Darren. This is like the number one question I get Victoria all Cross the time. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Cross I think it's because you hit my you know my area, Victoria Cross yeah. and Cedar Ridge. Yeah, the crews go to neighborhoods and there's a kind of a, a process yeah. chosen. Sometimes yeah. storms, storms and things happen and we get but rerouted. If somebody but doesn't want to pay, doesn't want to do the 50-50, yeah. how do they know when they're going to get a new tree? Um, I don't know the answer question. to that. One thing they usually do, I don't know, is they'll put in their service request and we'll just respond back to them with kind of what the plan is when it's coming so by. I, I, my tree didn't get taken down, but if I had a tree that gets taken down, mm -hmm. right, the city comes down and takes down my tree. And I'm just trying to understand this because I do get yeah. this question. There's it's now up to me that. to put in a service request to get a new tree. The city won't automatically no, do No, that. no, we will Not do that. All. I'm just saying that's one way that if, if they're curious, they can do so, and so they yeah. can kind of mark it, and then they'll get a response of some sort there, as to where it's at. But There's several steps. We'll remove a, a dangerous tree, and then we'll get sure. to all the trees. Um, we do stump removal and put you know grass seed back down or, and temporarily sometimes, and then we will have a plan to bring back trees. But we've, we need to probably, we'll be looking at budgeting very soon about putting more money in for more tree replacements. All I was saying is if they don't want to wait for the one that's scheduled from the city for free, that they could put some money in and, and get I, moved I, up. I get that. So I get it, the but if they want to know where they are, they can put in a quest, they can call Public Works, they can go to the website. We'll, we'll make sure that the website's more prominent. Um, I don't, th I don't believe, and unfortunately, you know, obviously, I don't know if Amy knows the answer, but with uh, Joe and Joe not here, I don't think they put placards on all the houses and say, hey, your tree, expect your tree they in must three not, months. I, I, I don't believe that's probably not quite possible, but yeah. depending on availability of trees, with EAB going all over Illinois, um, there's actually a shortage of trees. Oh, here's Amy. Maybe she knows a little more <laughs> than I do. Um, I think that last year we may have had uh door hangers that we put on the door i don't know yeah. if they're still doing it or not so. and um and, and i do think that they are doing the tree replacement at first first come first serve so if you put in a service request um you're going to get one you know the only way that they would plant a tree in a location um that of somebody that didn't put in a service request was if they didn't spend all of the tree replacement money uh, in the program with service requests in the system. Uh, if if it, it's first come first serve, so if, if the service request fills up with service, uh, with tree requests, and that's all the money that they have that year in the budget to replace, then yeah, you will have to be in the system and that they sort them by date of when the service requests were made, so. So 50,000 per year to replace the trees, what did we? 50,000. I, I think don't know if it was like that much. Yeah, I think it's something like that. About. 50? We have yeah. money in a couple of different places, but there were three, uh, 50,000 in the tree replacement. And then 25 somewhere. And then 100,000 in the emerald ash bore oh, under yes. capital projects. So we've got it in a couple of different. But uh, some of that funds way, goes to help with Homer. Not only our crews work on this, but we also contract with Homer Tree Service. We've actually looked at doing some cost estimates with them to say, well, what if we needed you to help us? What is it going to cost for you to guys take out 500 trees this year? So we've, we've got some estimates we've been modeling and what kind of funding we have available as the year ends. We may be able to get a few more of them down. And I think as we look at future years, we can reallocate some of that money to get more trees available. Um, I think I wasn't fully aware of the service request portion, so I think we may want to revisit the website and see what it says. And we may need to add some clarification language that, you know, first come, first serve, you know, the way to get these back quicker would be to put in a service request for a new yeah, tree. I, I don't think it, I can't to, remember what to it a says. resident who doesn't watch this and pay attention, and frankly, right. I have, right? But True. I don't think it's the natural thought of the city just took down my tree. Oh, now I need to go put in a service request right. in the city to get a tree, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's not really. They don't have to, but it, it, it'll take the longest, I guess, to replace that tree if they don't. So, but I think we need to maybe revisit that and okay. see what this, we can do better. This hit Karen Springs, and I had a I had a ton of questions that I had to talk to Joe and really under. I'm like, just explain to me A to Z how this works. Mm -hmm. And biggest thing is funding, man hours, getting around, doing it, prioritizing, which we talked about, which ones were dead and so forth. And, Andrew. and now we're talking about like let, let's back out of the neighborhoods a little bit through the arteries so we can get more development, clean up what we're looking at, and then get back into the neighborhoods. Um, and then the other part was. Uh, you know, like I asked him, I said, so if you pass by a tree that's not on the survey, because he has a survey he's going by, Joe had said that if we see a dead tree, we're taking it down, we're marking it, we're putting it on our list, and that was get in, that's in a priority, because we had a bunch of people asking about certain things. Uh, I had these strange requests that somebody actually said, do not 
take down my ash trees. Gotten that too. I've spent a lot of money putting chemicals and everything, and I don't, you know, I don't care if it's on a survey or not. I, it's good, it's healthy, it's and everything. And Joe said, tell us what it is so we can put you on the list and say, okay, when we pass by there, they're obviously not gonna cut down a very healthy tree that's there, that's on that <coughs> survey. So if, if people are out there have done a lot of treatment and everything to save their ash trees because they love their ash trees, they should let Public Works know so they can mark that on that list, that tree survey list. Well, yeah, my whole neighborhood is afraid that these trees are just getting chopped down and never coming back at this point because there's there just hasn't been communicated. So right. I'm getting That's people saying, accurate. just don't take my tree. I don't care how bad it looks, just don't take it. I'd rather have this than because frankly, a lot of it is still stumps. That's the other thing. So it's just the well, yeah. first stump later than yeah. the yeah. new one. The stumps. We don't own a stump grinder, so we have to farm that out. It's, yeah. um, you know, so we, we wait until we get a few of them or a few neighborhoods, and then we rent the equipment and go out. We looked at buying one, but they were like 50, 60, 70,000. Is there actually um, on the website um, um, the time frame of certain areas when they will get their trees? Cut I'm not down? sure that's on the website. I know Public Works has a list, and we do get calls about that. When are you going to get to me? And we do kind of handle those. Um, well, and I had um, a couple calls, and I sure. did uh, call you, and, and, um, and you, had, you were kind enough to um, extend that call or email to um, right. Joe. And I was able to get an answer, which was nice, because then I could go to the door. You know, I went to the neighbor and said, look, your tree is is on schedule to be cut down. Right. This is when it's going to do it. So I had an actual time frame, which was fantastic. Yeah. Because that's all they really want to know is the yeah, time frame. Many times it's the condition of the tree. I mean, if it's perfectly healthy looking, they're not going to just grab that one first. They're going after other ones. And they went through the whole neighborhood. Something. Once they got, right. got in there, they took care of the whole neighborhood. The only good news is at, at the rate we're achieving this, um, this should be pretty much handled in about three years. We're fortunate we're not a community that kind of overspread too fast in a certain time period where ash trees were very popular and cheap and quick growing. Some communities have 20,000 trees to replace. Um, you know, we've only got like 2,200. You know, I asked Public Works to try to keep up with at least four or 500 a year. It sounds like we've got over 800 in the last year and a half or so, so we're right on target to um, get this completed within the next few years. And then it's, I think all the trees will be gone, um, but we'll still be planting trees for a few years beyond that. Okay. Um, Let's get that information squared away, Jack, and let's put it in an email blast format and in a Facebook post, and let's get it to the Alder folk so that they can spread it out to their constituency. Okay, anything else? Uh, just quickly for new business, uh, Comicopolis at the White Oak Library is going on this Saturday. It's looking to be really fun. I recommend you know anybody who wants to go over there. There'll also be... Um, one of the artists in the summer art series, Jason Brammer, he's going to be at the Gaylord Building doing, he's a fantastic artist. He's going to be painting all day from a live model, giving tips and demos. So anybody who's got an uh, event for the arts or for comics, there's going to be lots of stuff. There'll be a movie in here that night, you know, so a lot of fun. So look it up on the White Oak Library or the summer art series site. I've got something. What do you got? Uh, I just want to talk... Uh, I met with um, Ben and Amy and Chris Alm and um, um, Candace uh, Schultz from um, Strain Brand. Engineering today. Uh, one thing that struck me at the last meeting was when Chris brought up this, uh, was talking about uh, the, this two-mile bu buffer zone and, and, and how Lockport um, wasn't involved, uh, virtually nowhere in Lockport could we drill a well based upon what we heard a couple weeks ago. So I, I did a lot of research over the past two weeks. Um, the good news here is is that uh, Strand is right on top of this. Um, they, they brought a draft of a letter that they're going to be sending to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, to readdress um, uh, maybe allow us to come back to the levels that we had in 2010. Um, and possibly use some uh, some sites that um, were shut down, not the exact holes, but holes within the general vicinity uh, that do happen to fall just outside of the two-mile radius. So um, Chris is going to be here sometime, hopefully, hopefully at the next meeting in three weeks, with the reply to the letter that they sent to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, that kind of ties in what we heard earlier today with the Long Run Creek seep, um, based upon the... Um, uh, I, I had uh, correspondence with the um, 
ecologist who actually did the, a lot of the research there, and he's not in favor of up in the north end, i.e. the ML Realty property where we have a designated well opportunity up in that area. So we're gonna have to look somewhere south of there. So um, it, it looks a whole lot better, I think, than a couple of weeks ago when he says, we don't know what our options are at, at that time. That's all. Oh, hey, and just a quick clarification. Comicopolis is not this Saturday. <laughs> it's next Saturday. Fifth. Sorry. This Saturday is the Artist Guild. Sunday, the Artist Guild uh, trunk show. Uh, okay. The, so the Artist Guild trunk show this? This Sunday. Okay. From 1 to 5. Very good. Comicopolis following Saturday on the 25th. Oh, and by the way, it's not Aaron. Uh, it's not Jason Brammer. Jason Brammer is the artist of last year. A guy named Aaron Miller. So only if you're an art guy would <laughs> you know this. Well, really so just disregard guy. everything I say from now on. <laughs> Summer art series, August 1st. Right. <laughs> Mayor, I can say one thing. Uh, con condolences to Joe Finley and his, yeah. his mother his from mother. everybody and everything. I know his uh, prayers are with him. And uh, congratulations to Capadonna. Chris Capadonna had a baby, baby girl couple weeks ago yeah, yeah. yeah so i didn't know that either i was like what and he's just so he's probably home watching us and changing some newborn diapers yeah all right so if there's nothing else then a uh, a motion to adjourn make the motion second all right that's uh alderman bartleson seconded by somebody over there <laughs> bob yeah uh, all in favor aye. aye you guys just quick two minutes yep. two minutes two minutes, two minutes. <laughs> it can never be a little bit more for somebody with a bad back Alice, you want to give us a, a roll call so we can? Sure. Petrakos? Here. Uh, Capitona and Gilogli are absent. Smith? Here. Heston? Here. Vandermeer? Here. Coretta? Here. Bartleson? Here. Six present. All right. First thing we're going to do is have a, uh, a motion to have a consent agenda. So moved. Second. Alderman Peretta, seconded by Alderman Vandermeer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we have regular city council meeting minutes uh, from July 1st, the Committee of the Whole meeting minutes from July 1st. We've got uh, the June 17th Will County TCC presentation on Canton Farm Road meeting minutes. There's our payroll period uh, ending July 5th, approval of bills. There's a facade grant application uh, for 117 East 9th Street. There is the extension of contract for design and engineering construction which was uh, uh, for uh, with V3. And there was well number nine redrilling engineering contract. And it looks like everything. So can I have a motion to approve a consent agenda? So Make a motion. Alderman, Alderman Bartleson, seconded by Alderman Deskin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then uh, what else we got? Let's jump on down to um, Board of Local Improvement meeting. Oh, man, we got to do a Board of Local Improvements meeting? Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, this is similar to what we did in May of this year. Uh, the project at uh, Route 7 and Thornton Street was uh, funded through a special assessment, which requires a Board of Local Improvements to yes, conduct a meeting. We do that as part of the City Council meeting, so it would be appropriate to open that meeting. I believe we have three members of the Council who are on the Board of Local Improvements. All right, so I'd like to call to order a uh, Board of Local Improvements meeting. So can I have a motion to do that from one of the members? That's I'll you. Motion. I'll second. All right, so uh, Alderman Bartleson, seconded by Alderman Deskin. All in favor? Aye. All right, we're now in our Board of Local Improvement meeting. And I believe Amy Wagner is going to present the uh, payment uh, request. Yep. Um, as you all may have noticed, the Thornton Street uh, intersection improvement project is nearly complete and the signal has been activated. Um, there's a few outstanding punch list items that need to be completed. Um, one item is the street name signs at the top of the uh, poles um, had not been installed the last time I was out there. I'm not sure if they've been installed now, but that's one of the items that's uh, outstanding on the punch list. Um, but uh, D has um, submitted a pay request, number five, in the amount of $363,535.28. Um, there is still an outstanding um, amount 
um, of $185,328.37 for retainage and any um, small uh, items that haven't been added to the bill at this time, but it's fairly close to what the final cost estimate is going to be. Okay. Any questions? So I, I, I make the motion that we accept Amy's recommendations to okay. pay the bill. Motion made. Second. Second about Alderman Bartleson. Um, just a quick roll call. Joanne? Yes. Darren? Yes. Steve? Aye. Unanimous? <laughs> All right. <laughs> we possibly call another meeting inside of this meeting. It's like inception. Yeah. Right? It a could meeting be and a done. meeting. That's right. All right. right. All right. Well, can I call an uh, adjournment to uh, to Board of Local Improvements meeting? I make that motion. Uh, Neskin, so uh, all the uh, Bartleson. All in favor? Aye. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. All right, Amy. What else you got now that we're back in the regular world? Well, now that we're back in the regular City Council meeting, we need to approve the resolution to uh, <laughs> to uh, for the pay request. Is that right? Yes. We have a resolution. Yes. For and, and Mr. Mayor, members <laughs> of the council, this may be difficult for people who may be watching at home. The, the special assessment is an old financing mechanism for public improvement <laughs> projects. It predates special service areas and other ways of paying for public improvements. Um, what it requires is uh, adjacent property owners who benefit from a public improvement project to contribute a certain portion. This project had the two adjacent property owners who are benefiting from this project assessed for a proportional share of the improvements. So in order to authorize payments, there's a process under the state statute that requires a Board of Local Improvements to be formed, have the Board of Local Improvements oversee the project, approve the payments, and if they do that, then it goes to the full City Council. So that's why we have a two-step process in, in this particular project. No one else is being assessed for this project. It's strictly the two property owners who voluntarily agreed to be part of this process. So it's not as if there's a tax being imposed on someone unwillingly. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. I know it's confusing. All right, very good. So uh, now we need a motion to uh, approve the pay estimate that we just talked about. Make that motion. Alderman Deskin. Second. Seconded by Alderman Vandermeer. Um, can I have a uh, roll call? Mr. Rockos. Yes. Smith. Yes. Deskin. Yes. Vandermeer. Yes. Weddle. Yes. And Bartleson. Yes. Six days. Motion carried. Okay. Um, so we don't need another there's like two actions that say the same thing yeah no it's just one <laughs> okay all right Amy you want to go on to the next one ED3 yeah. uh, the next item on the agenda is the fourth street reconstruction project change order um, as I spoke uh, to at the committee of the whole meeting earlier um, the fourth street reconstruction project is being finalized at this time um, and the project is over um, the awarded amount um, in the amount of $64,120.96, and uh, we are recommending authoriz authorizing the additional cost incurred for the construction of the 4th Street Reconstruction Project. All right. Can I have a motion to approve? I move. Second. All right. That's Alderman uh, Petraco, seconded by Alderman Smith. Any questions? Can I have a roll call, please? Petrakos? Yes. Yes. And Bartleson. Yes. Six days. Motion carried. Uh, go ahead. The third item on the agenda is the parkway parking application for 926 Madison Street. Uh, this was discussed at the last uh, Committee of the Whole meeting, and our recommendation is um, that the parkway parking application be denied. Okay. So, yes to deny. That, how do you word that? I will make the motion to deny the request. Okay, make a motion to deny the request. I'll second it. Yes, right. and a yes vote would mean you're denying the request. No vote is voting in favor of the request. Okay, all right. You don't get these too many. So, all right, so uh, Jason's seconding the motion to deny the request. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, who was the first? Oh, uh, Deskin. Yeah, Deskin. All right, so if you say yes, you are denying the request. So can we have a roll call, please? Petrakos. Yes. Smith. Yes. Deskin. Yes. Vandermeer. Yes. Weddle. Yes. Bartleson. Yes. Six yeses. And motion carried. 
Yes, uh, the request is denied. Okay. All right. Uh, what else you got there, Amy? We loaded yes, up. Yes, I tonight. am the only person that has anything on the agenda tonight. <laughs> um, uh, my next item on the agenda is the seventh and summit storm sewer project bid results. Um, if you will recall, in 2013, the city hired Baxter and Woodman to complete the design for, or to complete a master storm, stormwater master plan for the north downtown area. Um, in this master plan, a project was identified uh, to install storm, storm sewer on Summit Street wow, um, between uh, Illinois 7 and 7th Street um, to reroute some of the stormwater that is coming across Summit from the shopping center and the um, um, townhome development behind the shopping center. Um, it was running across the street, across Illinois 7, into the small creek that runs behind Dairy Queen, uh, backing the creek up, um, rendering the storm sewer outfall that services 3rd Street useless and causing 3rd Street to flood. Um, we put this project in the CIP, and um, the design was finished um, earlier this year. On July 10th, 2015, there were four proposals submitted and the lowest bid was received from Lynn Cox and Sons Excavating in the amount of $693,537.25. This low bid was significantly higher than the budget amount, but slightly under the latest cost estimate of $800,000. The original estimate for this project was based on new 12-inch RCP to be installed on both Summit and 7th Street. However, during the design, um, the storm sewer on Summit Street had to be upsized to a 42 inch and the, to accommodate the existing 42 inch uh, storm sewer that was uh, feeding into it. And the 42 inch storm sewer on 7th Street had to be replaced with a 72 inch line to be able to accommodate these flows. Uh, this increased the cost of the project significantly. The 17th and Lawrence uh, storm sewer project originally planned for 2015 will be postponed until 2016 since the design has not yet been completed. The city also received an additional $50,000 grant from Will County Stormwater Committee for this project. Um, I provided a breakdown of the budgeted um, amounts versus the um, uh, amounts for stormwater altogether. Uh, versus the proposed contract award and this budget amount uh, amendment needed to award this project is about $113,000. We recommend that the contract be awarded to Le Lynn Cox and Sons excavating in the amount of $693,537.25. All right, looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Alderman Peretta, seconded by Alderwoman Bartleson. Any discussion? Um, well, we're awarding it tonight. Um, they have 15 days to execute the contract and schedule a pre-construction meeting. Um, so we're looking at um, the end of July uh, for that to happen. I would say mid-July, beginning of August, when the project starts. Now, these the, the design changes were already made. They were bid out. Those were found during design. Did you just not see the storm? How did it? Um, the stormwater master plan was a basic, you know, document to try to, you know, identify all of the areas and they put um, very rudimentary um, um, estimates in there and um, during the design um, there was more um, investigation done and it was found that the storm sewer coming from the shopping center was much larger than they had originally anticipated. And, All righty, anything else? We can have a roll call then. Bartleson? Yes. Peretta? Yes. Vandermeer? Yes. Wilson? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Petrakis? Yes. The state's motion passes. And my, I think this is my final mm. item on the agenda, <laughs> is the seventh in Washington reconstruction bid results. Um, this project involves a full reconstruction of 7th Street from State to Washington and Washington Street from 5th to 7th and will include water main, curb and gutter, storm sewer, and landscape restoration. 
uh, water main uh, replacement on 7th Street is a priority for um, fire flow requirements and these portions of Washington and 7th Street are also in very poor condition and a priority for reconstruction. On June 26, 2015, there were three proposals submitted and the lowest bid was received from Austin Tyler Construction in the amount of $1,083,899.29. This low bid was significantly higher than the budgeted amount, but slightly under the latest cost estimate. This, in the original es estimate, only the four inch water main on 7th Street was listed to be replaced. Because of the age of the remaining main and water break history, it was also recommended during design that the main on Washington be replaced as well, effectively doubling uh, the water main replacement cost for this contract. We recommend that a contract be awarded to Austin Tyler Construction in the amount of $1,083,899.29. All right. Motion by Brian Smith. Second. Seconded by Alderman Deskin. Question for uh, Lisa. Yep. Are we okay budget wise? Well, we're just getting started in the CIP. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so far we're okay. Um, financially, we have enough cash reserves to be able to uh, accept these overages, but We'll get to the point where if we don't have enough revenue then we may have to back down on some of those projects yeah, but we're you. a few years away from that okay. question for me when something doubles the budget of a, a certain project does that come back upstream that you know compared to the cip like because now that's essentially a, a whole project in itself compared to other things that were planned how does that get rained we we designed the CIP to be flexible with revenues and costs. So if, for example, if the state changes uh, their share of funding to the city and we have less money available for projects, we'll do less than may have been scheduled for that year. Um, if projects run over and we have a several consistent one, ones of those, maybe something scheduled that year will have to be pushed off to another year. So uh, our goal was to achieve everything in that um, CIP in about six years. If overages continue to happen and budget revenues fall short, it'll be an eight year capital improvement program. And I don't think the list changes as far as trying to achieve all those improvements. Um, we are finding things that we need to add and then we are finding costs that are adding to the overall CIP. Um, but again, the goal is to continue to make those improvements as we can. I mean, we don't want to you know, go out and borrow money to do it or right. anything. So, and If I could make another um, point, too. Um, it, it didn't double the cost of the project. It only doubled the cost of the water main portion of the project. So um, it, it's a little better than what it sounded. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. But... <laughs> <laughs> but also um, keep in mind that the the final construction cost is based on actual measured quantities in the field versus the the project pl the planned project quantities which may be you know vastly different if you look at the memo that I presented at the committee of the whole meeting um, the first three projects that we did this year were under budget by two hundred forty thousand uh, dollars from the final versus the awarded in the, in the roadway construction portion I, so I, I get that whole portion the, the added water main was that in the CIP somewhere else like down the road no okay. just wanted to save on the back end <laughs> all right we still have to vote on this okay. have a roll call unless there's anything else there's nothing else Topics? yes Yes. 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 Okay, it's motion. All righty. Nothing else? Mayor, I have one item I thought of that I'd like to mention on our new business. Um, the American Legion is going to be hosting the half size replica of the Vietnam War traveling uh, monument. Um, that's going to start, it's a three or four day event. It's going to start on August 20th at 6 p.m. with an open ceremony, and all the mayor and council will be invited to participate in that. It's a really nice, uh, unique opportunity for Lo Lockport to host this. You'll get visitors from quite a region to come here. It's Again, it's the half-size replica, so it's a pretty sizable um, staging and event um, at the American Legion on Archer Avenue. Um, we're going to do a press release and try to get some media exposure for it uh, regionally as well, and I just wanted to bring that up that uh, next month it'll be here for a couple days. What time on the 20th? It's August 20th at 6 p.m. will be opening ceremonies. And you'll all get you'll all get invitations, but I just thought I'd bring it up. I don't know how we can do this, but we have a you know a boatload of Vietnam vets here. You know, sure it would be nice if we could have some type of unofficial official something for them 
at the dedication ceremony on behalf of the city of Lockport along with this bill? Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's a great idea. I don't know how we get in touch. Wouldn't that be the VFW? To, to yeah, that would be the VFW and the Legion. But. I'll have Jody, can you make a note? Let's have Jody look into that. She'll contact Mike Myers, of the, you know, uh, the Legion and the VFW. We'll, we'll make it work. I like that idea. Okay. All right. We done? We have a motion to adjourn? So move. You passed. You're already good. You're in the consent agenda. You win. You just listened to the rest of the meeting without <laughs> needing to listen to it. <laughs> Man, yeah, you could have left like 30 minutes ago. <laughs> I looked up at you and went like this. You just thought I was making faces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're good to go. You're good. You're All right. right. So, uh, Alderman. Uh, uh, Petrakos. Sorry, man. Petrakos, <laughs> who wants a second getting out of here? Yeah. Seconded by Ferretta. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry, man.